Great. Well, thank you all so much for um, attending our Data for Wildlife Challenge and welcome everybody. We are delighted to have you all on board and very excited to see what amazing data-led solutions we can all come up with over the next day and a half. And it's heartening to see so many of you here today united by our common desire to disrupt and end the illegal wildlife trade forever. I just want to say how grateful we are to be joined by some of the leading experts in the world on this call. It's very humbling. It's uh, quite nerve wracking for my job for introducing everyone. So hopefully I don't mess up. Um, but we have some fantastic speakers, including our keynote speaker, Wendy Nilsson, who I'm excited to introduce you to shortly. We've had some fantastic mentors who have been working with the teams over the last couple of weeks and informing them of the different free challenges ahead of the hackathon. And we're joined by some fascinating global participants from many different regions around the world. So I, I just want to say thank you again. You'll probably hear me say thank you a lot throughout this presentation. Uh, so you can keep a tally of how many thank yous. But, but I do truly mean it. And um, we all sincerely need all of your collective expertise, your wisdom, passion and determination to, to really stand a chance in tackling the tragedy that is the illegal wildlife trade. So by way of introduction, my name's Harry Wright. I'm the CEO and founder of Bright Tide, which is a environmental organization that works with companies, universities, and public sector organizations to help educate and empower individuals to take action on different climate change and biodiversity issues. And the illegal wildlife trade is one of the areas that we focus on. So Bright Tide is a co-organizer of the Data for Wildlife Challenge alongside Meredith Gore, from the University of Maryland, uh, Patricia Raxter from Focus Conservation, Renata Conrad and Kimin Lee from Worcester Polytechnic Institute. And we're also supported by Meredith's Criminology Institute. And the hackathon has been funded by the National Science Foundation Funding Planning Grant, which is a new collaboration between the University of Maryland, Worcester Polytechnic Institute and Focus Conservation to learn more about disrupting illegal supply networks. My colleagues Meredith, Patricia, Renata and Cumin will be talking more shortly about the three different challenges that the participants will be working on over the weekend. So I first got into the illegal wildlife trade sector uh, when I first set up the conservation charity when I was 26 and working as a trainee lawyer in, in London. And I, I set up the charity called the Conservation Project because I really wanted to understand what the main issues were in conservation and what some of the challenges that researchers and NGOs were facing around the world. And we also had a mission to try and get more young people involved in conservation. And after working on a number of different projects in the Maldives, where we worked uh, on coral reef restoration, looking at the issues of hawksbill turtles being trafficked, uh, and also looking at the calamity of uh, plastic pollution and fishing nets, which were killing lots of marine species there, uh, soon was uh, soon became aware of the huge challenges and the complex challenges faced by many different researchers and uh, NGOs around the world. And that was coupled with the complexity of tackling the illegal wildlife trade, which in itself is not just a, a conservation issue, it's a criminal issue, and it can be extremely dangerous as well. So as I got more involved in conservation and I saw some incredible people doing just most groundbreaking work, sometimes with very limited resources and support. I wanted to try and connect my experience of working in the private sector, in the legal industry, and many of my colleagues who were accountants working in the tech industry, uh, in marketing and advertising. And I wanted to give them the opportunity also to use their skills to help conservation research around the world and to help biodiversity projects. And that's why we set up Bright Tide, because we want to connect the private sector to frontline conservation efforts and better utilize resources, expertise, and networks that the private sector has to offer to further conservation goals and ambitions. And the illegal wildlife trade is one of our main focus areas because it is one of the greatest threats to wildlife that we know of today. It's a huge international crime. In fact, it's the fourth biggest illegal trade in the world and estimated at one to two trillion US dollars per year. And it's responsible for so much harm and for so much hurt, not only to amazing wildlife species, but to entire communities and families and indeed the world. And wildlife crime impacts every nation on earth and frequently 
converges with other serious crimes like drug trafficking, sex trafficking, and weapons trafficking, and it poses a severe threat to human health, with three quarters of all emerging diseases being of zoonic origins. And we can only realize how much impact that zoonic diseases can have on the entire planet. And the loss of wildlife and biodiversity at such unprecedented rates also poses huge financial risks to our business and global economy. For example, more than half of the world's economic output, 44 trillion of economic value generation, is moderately or highly dependent on nature. But despite these clear threats, the perilous dangers and the glaring alarm bells, the illegal wildlife trade remains an attractive prospect for international criminals as a low risk, high gain venture. And internationals behind, international criminals behind wildlife trafficking are becoming more savvier, more clever, and are openly conducting transactions using different financial instruments like Bitcoin, for example, or, and they're openly selling wildlife across social media and online. And as the criminals continue to stay one step ahead of us, we must continue to catch up with them. And that's why this incredible project is of huge value. And as we look to develop over the weekend, new data sets and new data tools and applications to target and deter wildlife criminals online, we will build a better picture of the value chain of wildlife crime from both the physical element to the online element and both from the source and to the demand. So overall, I just want to thank you again to everyone in this room. Whether you're a student or a young professional looking to use your particular skill sets to protect wildlife, a law enforcement agent looking to bring down wildlife criminals, an academic or a professor at the forefront of research and education into wildlife crime, or a research officer or an analyst that scours the web to build intelligence and collaborate with others to tackle wildlife crime online. You are all heroes. And I think what we need now is a change in moral attitudes from our world leaders and from many of our most powerful organizations worldwide. We need to see that self-interest is for the past and common interest is for the future. And it's going to take a gigantic effort to tackle this insidious illegal trade. So I wanna thank you all again for being here. And I'm now delighted to introduce you to our fabulous keynote speaker, for Data for Wildlife, Wendy Nilsson. Wendy Nilsson, PhD, is the Acting Deputy Division Director in the Information and Intelligence System Division of the Computer and Information Science and Engineering Directorate at the National Science Foundation. She is also the Lead Program Director in the Smart Health Program, and her work has focused on the intersection of computing and human functioning. Her interests span the areas of sensing, analytics, cyber physical systems, information systems, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and robotics. And prior to joining the National Science Foundation, Wendy was at the National Institute of Health. Wendy, that's an incredible CV and background that you have there, and we're absolutely delighted to have you here uh, today as our guest speaker. So I'm now going to um, share my screen, and I will pass over to you for uh, introducing uh, the keynote for Data for Wildlife. So, um, Harry, everyone, thank you for having me come. Um, I must say, you are the heroes, and I'm super honored and humbled to be allowed to, to talk here. Now, I'm going to start with an in informed consent. Um, you all know so much more about this than I do. Um, I'm lucky, you know, people ask me why I'm at the National Science Foundation. It's because of projects like this, where I know they can change the world. Um, and so, you are the heroes, and I am super honored to be here with the heroes this morning. So um, before we do anything, thank you all for what you're doing. Harry, that was the most amazing introduction. Um, so thank you all for what you're doing because you're making a difference and it's huge. So, um, so let's get started. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna tell you things you already know. Can, Harry, can you do the next slide, please? Is that working for you now, Wendy? No, I'm still seeing the same slide. Okay, sorry, bear with me. But I will say, well, well Harry's changing that slide. Um, my first slide is really, we, we are thinking about these things as supply chains. And I think what Harry was saying is, we're, we're really, you know, we've looked at this in so many different ways. And, you know, wildlife trafficking that you know, you know what the definition is, but you know, only illegal drugs 
human and firearms trafficking eclipse wildlife crime. And that may also be because we also don't have the data on everything either. So um, it, it's a huge, huge problem. And I think, you know, it, as you all know, this really puts not just the wildlife, it puts communities at risk and it puts our future at risk. So um, there's a lot riding on us doing a better job of understanding and committing. I also think COVID has really put a spotlight on this. Um, you know, when we think about, you know, we thought about wildlife, we think about all the animals and biodiversity, but zoonosis is a real issue. And I think COVID has made that really um, an obvious issue. And I think it gives another reason is if we didn't have enough to change the way we're doing things, it's another, and it brings in, by the way, it brings in a whole nother set of partners who have a stake in the game at this point. So, um, you know, if you think about building these coalitions, maybe COVID, the bright side of COVID is it helps us think about this. So, um, Harry, can I have the next slide? Oops, it's not moving again. All right. But I think, that, you know, when I think about this, um, I think about this too. I think, um, you know, social media has done lots of positives. It has done a ton of negatives. But um, one of the things when I was, was looking around and thinking about this, um, social media sales of reptiles, you know, um, the internet does lots of great things, but it also connects people with the wrong wrong goals and the wrong um, incentives. So really thinking about what kind of data we need to, to do this. And I, and I really think that's, that's why bringing this group together is so useful. Um, you know, we've done this in all sorts of different ways. We've tried to do the conservation in many different ways. But, but when we look at the complexity of the supply chain, we understand um, they, we understand the complexity of the problem, and then we understand the complexity of the solution. So Harry, could I have the next slide? So it's, I think it's gonna, oops. Um, so I do want to say, I, I actually skipped one back with the um, earlier, but you know, to the scale of the problem, but you all know that. Um, I do think this came out of a paper I was actually became aware of because of reading the report that, that you all sent in. Um, but really thinking about wildlife trafficking supply chains, thinking about that we can create these, we can take all this data. We have so many different, if we think about a supply chain, and frankly, Walmart shouldn't be the only place to benefit from supply chains. Um, understanding a supply chain, flipping it on its head. So generally what we try to think of in a supply chain research is, you know, uh, I, I'm not picking on Walmart, but you know, when you think about the leaders of supply chains, they, they wanna have the products on their shelves when they need them, not before and not after. So they have to plan out the entire who's supplying, how long it takes to get there, all of these steps that happen till that part or product ends up on your shelves and can be sold. And so if you stop and you flip that and you say, if we have, the, we have this wildlife trafficking, can we flip that whole uh, supply chain on its head? Can we look at, we know here's the end of the problem. Where are all the steps? Who are all the players? Who are all the, how are the market, how is the marketing done? How are the communications done? You know, if we can start to think of the incentives, the factors that are in there, we can create these causal models, which are really reversing the supply chain. Um, and think about, what I loved about this paper was really, it was looking at different kinds of supply chains, cocaine, wildlife, and sand. Um, I thought sand was such an exciting idea to add in there, um, but, thinking about if you put them together, we, we often think of them as completely different things. Animals are one thing, sand is another thing, illegal drugs, firearms, they're all, but they're all driven by, in, by incentives for funding, for money, um, and they have markets. So if we start to think about them together, we can really take this and create these supply chains, flip them on their head, and that's the way I think we disrupt these supply chains. And I think it gets us to a whole different way of thinking about uh, wildlife trafficking, but I think it also gets 
to some of the things. I feel like I, I missed a slide in here. Um, but I also think it gets into when we've when we've done this in the past. Oops, Harry, I think we're moving on its own. Sorry, Sorry. Bear with me. That's okay. Think, uh, it's, uh, let me try and go back for you. Okay, if you go back and I'll just talk about, I, you know, I know the things that have been done in the past and it's not for a lack of, of people working hard at this. You know, we've targeted poachers, we've targeted those people engaging in, it, in our wildlife trafficking. We've, we've also targeted, you know, we start in many of the um, illegal syndicates, we, we target the criminal syndicates involved in this, right? Often there's a person on the ground, but that's not the person driving everything. Right, those people are part of a chain. Um, but we've also started thinking about how do you target the end user's behavior here? Um, you know, if you can reduce the supply or you can lose the demand, you can reduce the supply. So thinking about that, I mean, you, you've seen, you know, there's, oh, that was a slide we had early. Okay, so that you have all seen that from the United Nations um, or the United, oh, I can't even remember which one, sorry. Um, from the United Nations Office on Drugs on Crime. Um, I was actually surprised about Rosewood when I saw that. Um, so I got a picture of a Rosewood because I didn't, didn't know what it was. Um, all right, Harry, if we can go. Um, so I just think um, it, okay, great. Just keep going, Harry. Good, next slide, please. So I think there's a, uh, Kayla's got a comment. We clearly need holistic transnational approaches to counter um, illegal wildlife trafficking. Oops, can we go back, Harry? We're, we're kind of, I'm afraid I've, I'm afraid I've set you up, Harry. I'm afraid my slides are setting you up here. Sorry, Wendy. Um, That's okay. Bridges between um, communities, is that the right one? This is good. So let's talk about this because I think one of the things that I really, I, that everybody that knows me knows that I'm passionate about is wicked problems and, and illegal wildlife trafficking. If that's not a wicked problem, I don't know what is. Um, but you know, in our in the past, as academics, even as nonprofits, academics, governments, we all thought we could do it on our own, right? That's the way the incentives were set up. We had expertise. Um, I'm lucky to be at the National Science Foundation where all the sciences are in one building, or at least virtually in one building at this point. Um, but even in our governments, we have different agencies in our, in our universities, we have different expertise, and we tend to group in that area and say, I can solve this. Um, and we, we have, but we have different equipment, we have different resources, we have different students. Um, and students bring all sorts of things to this, to this Thing. So thinking about these bridges, bringing together, if we want to really look at how do we change things, we need to bring these things, and I'm sorry, I come from computing, so I always put computing first, but biological sciences, engineering, legal, social sciences, behavioral, I'm sure I've missed some, biomedical disciplines are now should be a partner with zoonosis as an issue, industry partners, as Harry talked about before, financial Tracking the money in here, the financial institutions have a role in helping us change this. Uh, regulatory systems, governments, and legal systems. So I think what I think about is if you really want to have an impact in this world, and you all do, and again, you're the heroes, um, this is how you have this impact, by bringing together a group like this um, and having them work together and bringing these different skills, different resources, different areas of funding, um, different students, and that's how we're going to have this kind of impact. And that's how you're going to make, you all are going to be a link to making this incredibly wicked problem go end. Next slide, please, Harry. And I want to say these bridges are really, really hard. Um, I had a slide earlier, but I'll tell you, I often say, you know, I have slides that have a picture of a mouse and a picture of a picture of a computer mouse and a picture of a regular mouse. We don't speak the same languages. We don't talk the same way. When we try to cross disciplines, Harry's legal will sound one way, Meredith's science will sound another way. It's only when we work together that these things start to change and that we build the common language, we build the common understanding that allows each of, each of your expertise to come together in this really magical way. Um, I think I come from a world where um, 
basic science is the, is the key to what we do. And then I'll talk to others and they'll say, no, applied science is critical. There's neither one can survive without the other. So, and, 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 and the applications, you know, thinking about, you know, I might have somebody who's doing very basic internet work, but it might help you all figure out how we're doing something, um, how the illegal wildlife trafficking is using the internet to, to figure things out. When we work together, when we do this relay race back and forth is how we figure out how we can make this get this done. Next slide, Harry. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about how I ended up here on the, the disrupting illegal operations of illegal supply. Um, so there's a question, and maybe I'll answer it while we're see where we where we move to the next slide. Um, do I have a suggestion about how to make them work? I think that was Meredith's question. Um, how to make them successful and possible? There's a whole lot of literature on team science, you know, and and I'm sure this group knows it because you have enough different members of your team that if you didn't, you'd already be in trouble. Um, it, it's setting out your goals ahead of time, setting out your processes ahead of time. Um, communication is key. An event like this is key to making a team work. Um, I, I run programs that are very interdisciplinary and I'm amazed to see people say, we're gonna collaborate because we work down the hall from each other. There's plenty of people that work down your hallways that you never talk to or that you only talk to briefly, even, at, even before COVID. Um, collaboration takes work. It takes heart, it takes effort. Um, and it really takes time. So I think we funded the, the, the disrupting operations of illicit supply networks because we thought that putting in that time, effort and work deserved funding um, and it deserved a way to go. But it also brings in the supply chain idea. And um, my colleague, Georgia Ann Kluke, who actually runs our, um, our research division on supply networks said, you know, we've spent so many years making supply chains work better, making you know waiting lists better. She said, we can do so much more than this. We can transform the world if we, if we think about other things as supply and supply chain networks. And so that's when our disrupting operations of illicit supply chain networks came into being. And it really supports efforts like this. And I'm very proud to have been one of the supporters of this effort. And I know you all have, you're supported in so many different ways. But it really is to bring together interdisciplinary teams like you're talking about, because that's the way we're going to solve these wicked problems. Harry, could I have the next slide, please? So I think one of the things that I think is exciting about the, this initiative, not your part of the initiative, which is super exciting, but this supply chain is, is it really is looking at all sorts of things, human trafficking, wildlife trafficking. Um, illicit drug trafficking. So we're not just looking and saying, let's pick the big topics, let's pick stuff, let's just pick stuff. We're asking people to say, you know, what, what things are really important. We, I've learned so much in reading proposals on things I didn't even know were a program, problem. Um, and one, of the, one of the other projects we funded was on um, counterfeit drugs. Again, it's another supply chain. It works in a completely, probably works in very similar ways. Um, has different players, but again, it's another supply chain where there's a supply and a demand, um, and it and it's you know and it's something it's a supply chain we need to disrupt. Um, but we're and we're even talking about trafficking in virtual pro products because you know the internet makes a difference for almost everything. So um, I think what's exciting about this, and I think this harkens back to the paper that I, I referenced before from all that many of you are on. Um, this allows us to start to have conversations and talk about this in using a language that perhaps we can take the best of what we know about wildlife trafficking and bring it in together with drug trafficking. I didn't even know sand trafficking was a thing, but I should have, I should have guessed. I have, I live on a river and twice a day, two major barges of sand go down the river. And I always think, where the heck does that sand come from? Um, and, and I'm pretty sure I don't want to know because I'm pretty sure it's, a, it's not a good thing, but, um, maybe I'll go down and ask them the next time I pass that big, uh, that actually the truck, the, the boat that goes by doesn't stop from talk to anybody. So maybe I'll never know, but, 
Um, but, you know, thinking about, if we start to think about these things across too, I think we can help each other. Because where, you know, you have people saying drug trafficking, drug trafficking, things they've learned may be very helpful in wildlife trafficking. Different products, but maybe, maybe there are similarities in that supply chain that'll help us think about things. And I know that wildlife trafficking, when you think about that, you'll be informing all these other areas. So with that, Harry, I'm on my last slide, which is just a thank you. So if you don't get there, I'm okay with that, Harry. Um, I just want to say thank you for all that you're doing. Um, I, I think, you know, as I've as I've read your your work in your papers um, and listening to Harry this morning, you all you are the heroes, um, and we're all counting on you in so many different ways. Um, and you're not in this together, and not in this alone. Although I'm pretty sure it feels like that often. Um, but I know that this is a super important area. Um, I look forward to seeing all the good that comes from it. I also look at, you know, as a STEM professional, this is such a great way for students to change the world um, and be involved in STEM. So thinking about different students than we would have been able to attract initially, because this is the world and this is where they're going to grow up and where they're going to live. Um, and without, if we can't stop this, wildlife trafficking, uh, illicit wildlife trafficking, it changes the world they're gonna live in. So with that, I'll say thank you. I can answer any other questions, but remember, you're the heroes. Thank you. That was um, absolutely wonderful, Wendy. Thank you so much. And I, I do apologize for uh, the, the slides as well, um, but thank you, that was a uh, really inspirational. And uh, I think we can all agree with that amazing last, last message as well. So we have, a, we have a couple of questions. Um, I'm going to open it up to uh, Kaylee, who I think has uh, two questions to ask. So Kaylee, feel free to, um, to go ahead and ask your question. You're just on mute there, Kaylee. Hi, Wendy. Thanks, Thanks Harry. Um, I was just saying that was a really great talk and it was quite inspiring. I was just thinking about how we obviously need like holistic approaches and transnational approaches in particular to this issue. And I just thinking like, how can we raise the profile of natural resource trafficking at national and international governmental levels? Um, obviously we have the current response to zoonosis. So we've got kind of like a sounding board to jump off on, but how can we sort of continue that momentum going forward? And um, obviously as well, as being that the research community takes time to provide answers sometimes to this. And um, environmental security is not always seen as an important thing in national security. So I wondered if you had any thoughts on that. And then I did have another question, but I can ask that afterwards. Thank you. Kaylee, thanks for, thanks for great questions. Um, you know, I think, I, I again, I, I, I'm hoping that the bright side of COVID is that it points a finger to, to thinking about some of these questions. Um, I will say, I'm the one thing, you, you all know so much about this world. There is so much more, in, you know, deep diving into this world. And Renata's photobombing with a super cute child, by the way. Um, sorry. It's no super cute, Renata, don't worry. Um, yes, but I think, <laughs> so. no, 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 don't, please don't. Um, it's one of the best parts of Zoom, I think. You get cute dogs, cute cats, and cute kids wandering through all the time. Um, it's like the real world. Instead of our offices and our conference rooms where you would have never seen anything cute wandering through, um, that's the advantage of Zoom. So um, Kaylee, I think the one thing I am encouraged about this, and you all know much more about this than I do, is um, ever since we've started the Illicit Supply Chain Initiative, um, thinking about it this way, we've had interests from all parts of the US government so Department of Commerce has been interested. Um, Homeland Security talked to us. Um, so far, they're not official partners, um, but, they're, but they're involved in our review process. Actually, what was really fascinating is when the IRS called us. Now, like we all get creeped out. The IRS is on the phone. Like my friend Georgia Ann is like, the IRS is calling us. What do we do now? And I'm like, duck. Um, but, but the IRS has a big stake in this, right? Because this is this is uncollected taxes, and I hate to say that because you know it sounds so grotesque, but 
these are these are these are industries that don't pay tax. So the IRS is looking for people because of that. But if we can start to harness things like like the IRS in the US, I'm sure every country has some version that, that you don't want to pick up the phone for. Um, but I but I think if we can start to get people like that interested, it changes the dynamic. It helps us. And it gets to the question um, about real-time data. You know, some of these things help us get to real-time data when you can get other people who may have access to more resources, more funds, um, help us get that real-time data. I think what's also interesting too, and I'll go to your real-time data question, because um, I'm involved with an initiative in NSF and there's many more around the world um, that is the predictive intelligence for pandemic prevention. It's our PIP initiative. And one of the things PIP is trying to do is create surveillance systems. And so one of the things that might help us in wildlife tracking is, oh yes, sorry, Renata, but the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service. So if I, if I, if I say an acronym that you don't know, please just help me out there. Um, but, it, but when you think about these things, um, you know, if we start doing surveillance around public health, because we all know this pandemic you know, it was a, was, a, was a century between major pandemics. Everybody I know in the public health world doesn't think it's a century the next time. Um, that these are going to because, uh, and often because of natural resource factors, right? Um, these are going to be happening more frequently. So if we think about surveillance, it may give us some of the data that will help us deal with illicit wildlife trafficking too. Um, I know I know, uh, uh, no surveillance is a little scary, but I think if we're understanding movements of animals, movements of natural resources, um, if, as we're thinking about these larger ecosystems, right, that helps us, um, may help us in other ways that we never even expected. Thank you very much. That was a great answer. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Wendy. Um, Meredith, I think you put a question in the chat as well. If you'd like to ask that one. So I think I had I had this question about bridges, but I think that I think that Wendy um, answered it, um, and I I really I really uh, I really appreciate it. I think you know as a scientist, like I ca I care about these issues, and I'm also motivated to conduct science on it. But trying to be as successful as po as possible. Um, working on a science team um, and then we have this amazing group of folks that are willing to work with us for this for this data for wildlife challenge this weekend and so you know it's it's useful for me to think about the problem set and the science but that i also want to make sure that we're thinking about working together as a team um, because you know stronger together and stuff so um yeah i i really appreciated your 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 answer to that um so so thanks um, and I, I think Sam has a question yeah. now. Sam has a great question. I think you're muted, Sam. Hey, everybody. Sorry, I was hey. on mute. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so my question is that I've been reading a lot of these articles for the challenge one to find this uh, data on Instagram. And a lot of this, like trafficked animals are trafficked because of human entertainment and people are making real money off of having cute animals in their pictures or access to the animals. Um, so I'm wondering, like, in addition to disrupting the traffickers, is this also a matter of education to tell people like how should animals be treated? Um, as for my journey, you know, as a vegan, I honestly didn't know so much. And it's when I started to read more about for example, the agriculture industry, I've realized, you know, there's a big problem there too. So a lot of that problem, those problems are covered up by marketing and other types of um, like media campaigns that just don't really reach humans. So that's my biggest question. Like, how do we also educate people for how these wild animals should get treated and that it's wrong to have them you know, sit at home when they should be roaming in the pastures or fields. So, um, Sam, it's 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 really a great question. Um, when I was when I was looking at articles for this, one of the things that was striking was how many behavioral science articles were coming up in this. You know, how do we change user preferences, right? Because you know, there was ad campaigns. I am not a rug. Beautiful 
beautiful tiger and I am not a rug, you know, I am not a this. Um, we do have to change demand, right? We Part of this is you want to change this. We, we always focused on the supply end. Let's stop. The, let's stop poachers. Let's stop all of the trafficking. But that didn't acknowledge the fact that somebody wanted a tiger as a pet, right? Um, or in their whatever, um, or cute turtles or whatever. Um, you know, people, we have to stop both sides. And thinking about this as a supply chain helps us realize we have to cut down on the demand or we're not, you know, the supply, it's hard to kill a supply when there's still a demand. I think this is part of this is education. Part of this is working with the communications and behavioral community for, to figure out. I remember years ago um, in the US when they were trying to stop smoking and they did a whole lot of research for adolescents on smoking. And they found out that most of the ad campaigns that come out had actually encouraged smoking because they made it cool to smoke because you were like the anti, I, I don't need parents, right? Um, so they did they, they did this ad campaign, I don't even remember what it was called anymore, but it was, they, they partnered with the top ad company in the country and spent real money on creating an ad campaign. And basically it was, I'm too cool to smoke. Like, I don't have to do that because others want me to. Like, and that was the one that saw a reduction in teen smoking because that ended up all over the place um, and, it, and they pushed it out everywhere. But I think that was another one where, you know, there was gonna be a supply as long as there was demand. And so that helped us, you know, it's not a, that's not a done deal. You can't do one ad campaign and fix it. But I think that's part of how do you, if you think about the supply chain across, you can make a difference by bringing in the right team members at each point. How do we make it super uncool to not go watch a bear dance on a ball, right? How would that become a super disgusting, ooh, how could you do that kind of event? And that's, I think, that's where your communications and behavioral people come in and help you um, in shaping and framing that. And that's working with industry because, you know, part of that is, is allowing um, the people that are profiting off this to see that it's going to be a loss. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks, Thanks Sam. That's great. great. Um, I think, Renata, did you have a question to touch upon Sam's question there? Yeah, so, Wendy, as you were, I was typing the question as, as you're answering, but I, I, you know, there is so much focus on the supply. Um, you did mention the ad campaigns, you know, behavioral change. Do you see any other avenues to stem demand? Like, you know, is it prosecuting individuals who consume these products? Is it putting a lot more focus on the punitive side of, of, of owning these products? Like, you know, going after the, the purchaser. Um, rather yeah, I, I think reducing, reducing demand comes in many ways. Um, in the behavioral world, punishment doesn't work as well as rewards. So making it cool to not do something is probably a lot better. Than, than counting on the punishments, you know, um, but but it but it making you know I'm just thinking about that, that ridiculous what was it there was a in the U S there was a TV show about somebody doing all sorts of horrible things with tigers, um, and it got so much press. I'm a, I'm pretty sure it increased interest, not decreased interest. Um, I don't oh Tiger King, thank you, um, but you can tell how good I am at you know local news things, but um, but I remember hearing it and I'm thinking, why is this like prosecute the guy, get it over with, right? And and be done with it. But I'm afraid it actually reversed and made people, I, I mean, I'm just, I'm always worried about if we can prosecute people and get it done and get it done quickly and make it intense, it works. Otherwise we can get these people into the spotlight um, and often it doesn't have the effect that we want. So I think this is always the question of working together to figure out, you know, we don't want to not prosecute people, but we also want to figure out, you know, how do we, how can we stem the supply? How can we reduce the demand? And how can we punish those who are sitting in the middle too? Can I just add to that, Wendy, because one of the things that I think is really exciting about engaging the Department of, De of Commerce and Homeland Security 
and the um, revenue service in the United States is that the the sometimes the really big prosecutions for these crimes are money laundering. They're um, you know related to they they use financial laws, right? right? And so Sam, you had asked this question about you know animal welfare. We do have animal welfare laws in the United States, and many countries have animal welfare laws, but a lot of the times the penalties associated with those laws are not even they're not they're not big enough to merit the resources for prosecutors to go after them um you know there's like prosecutorial discretion and then also this the the fines aren't as 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 big and so there are these like deterrence effects these behavioral science effects so i think it's really exciting to see like commerce and and other and you know looking at this from the financial side i know the private banking sector is also really interested in this has been you know pulling together conversations about wildlife trafficking um and then e-commerce sites right so there's there's this huge private sector dimension as well um so sorry sorry to add on to that it was just it was, it was inspiring no I, I do think the financial laws you know sometimes we get a lot of things done around financial laws and and since this is there are all sorts of financial implications here. They have big penalties and they also have the resources to prosecute. So um, having them as a partner, having them on the team is good. It isn't the only answer though. I think in the past, we've had an only answer, an only answer, an only, you know, if this group can stop it, it's not. It's this group that I see on my screen that comes together in this complex and interesting way um, to think about it from so many different perspectives. It isn't just going to be a prosecutorial approach. It isn't going to be, you know, just a media campaign. It's going to be all sorts of different things that come together. And right, the Elliot put in TikTok and Instagram. Yeah, if you could get them on your side, that would really help. Right now, they probably, they probably make things worse in some ways and better in others. But, you know, Shifting those things, shifting attitudes and, and, and understanding and I think getting the data and really creating these causal models to understand this um, gets you to the point where you can have the impact. Thanks, Thanks that was great. great. Um, Loretta, I think you have a question. question. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, what are the uh, impressions or, you know, mindset of people towards um, you know, articles made out of uh, uh, this, what's it, from wildlife or towards wildlife products. So I, I, this is not my area and you all probably know more than I do. I think this is one of the areas for education that people have been working on. Um, you know, I remember, and I know it's not a done deal with mink and fur, um, but you know, it used, I grew up in New York City and it was striking on a Friday night how much fur was on the main streets. Um, it's fun when I go back home now and there's a whole lot less fur on that street or, or it's blue fur now, it's fake fur. Um, you know, but I don't think it's a solved problem, but I think this is again, changing what people expect. You know, was it super cool to have a mink? I think when my mother grew up, it was super cool to have a mink. I think she'd be more of a, actually when she inherited her mother's mink, they said, ooh, what do we do with this? So, um, I know that's just one example, but I think that that's part of part of just reducing that supply chain is reducing that demand and it's changing the attitudes. But like any in any really wicked problem, this is going to take multiple multiple ways to think about this. Absolutely, thank you, Wendy. Uh, we got some fascinating uh, conversations going on in the chat. I don't know if one of the, um, if Shira, did you want to maybe say a few words or anyone else? Go as well, it's really lovely to have you here. Um, feel free to sort of, um, if you want to ask any questions as well. Uh, no, I just wanted to just, as a background on demand reduction, then uh, much as Wendy mentioned, we, we look a lot into how we can use the even behavioral psychology psychology or lessons from marketing actual marketing for for social change um so how to use basically the same tools that are used to sell these products but to not sell them and obviously not doing a behavior is a lot harder to sell something not to do is a lot harder than to sell something to do 
Um, but we are uh, also looking into these sciences when we look at this. And, and yeah, at the, at the base, it's, I think also Wendy and everyone mentioned it, it's unfortunately we don't have time. Uh, these species are going to go extinct within our lifetime, most of them. So it's, it's about doing everything together. So demand reduction and supply reduction and, uh, and working with the transport and financial sectors and everything all together. So I think that now, even as opposed to maybe three, four years ago, when uh, I started delving deeper into this field, uh, we, we understand that it's, it has to be all at once and everyone is taking um, a very holistic approach at each and every yeah, species. We just don't have time. Yeah, Sorry I, for think, <laughs> I think the holistic approach you're talking about, it, it's, you know, what I'm seeing in this group and I think that, that, that this whole idea of thinking about these as supply chains through the whole thing and how, how do we disrupt them gets us to a different way. Of, it gets us to seeing everybody as a part of the solution in a much broader, the tent becomes broader and, it, and, and we can all think about this together because I think we all have such a vested interest in this area, whether we know it or not. And it's helping people understand what their role is. You know, helping them, helping understand from from the poachers and people that are doing the actual, you know, picking animals out of wherever they are, or breeding them, or sending them, or shipping them, and the companies that are moving these, all the way through those that are buying it. We have to disrupt them in every space. That's why you're the hero. Um, can I make a quick comment here? Uh, I think we it kind of really is linked to this market reduction approach. I think we often forget that if we, if we take the official definition of wildlife crime, it's really the taking, processing, transporting, and possessing of wildlife. So I think we have never focused on the fact that a possessing illegal uh, wildlife that's endangered or you're not supposed to possess, by simply possessing it, you're also committing a crime. And I think that element has not been emphasized a lot. We're really like just focusing on the transporting and poaching and so forth and not really the possession. So if we, I think, change the campaign and the conversation in that direction, that if you're possessing illegally obtained wildlife, then you are a wildlife criminal. I think that will have a stronger impact, right? On, you know, on this campaign, on this information about wildlife crime and hopefully, you know, by alerting people, alerting people's conscience about it, I think it will have a significant impact on the, on the demand reduction in overall wildlife crime. That's a great, it's a really good point. Changing it all the way through, changing public, public attitudes to change the demand, changing, changing, you know, changing it from the laws all the way down, I think, all the way to the people on the street. Thanks, thanks so much, Wendy. I think um, Jenny Desmond has her, and thank, thank you, Gary, as well. That was lovely. Well, well, um, I think Jenny has her hand off. I hope she has her hand off. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to be in a place where I have internet. So sorry for the strange background, but <laughs> hi everyone and thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a couple points that just I, I'm I'm hearing a lot of this and and I think the reason I'm bringing it up now versus later is I think it's great for us to be thinking about a few things as we go through these next presentations and through this process is um, that the legal versus illegal because the legal of course is a huge huge issue we all face when we we're just talking about. Um, people who want pet tigers, who have chimps, who dress up and do selfies. A lot of that is legal. In the U.S., it's, 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 it's pervasive. I mean, it's legal in, in many, many places. And, and a lot of what you're seeing that you really would think is awful and should be illegal is not. Um, so pet primates, pet big cats, and we have like the Big Cat Safety Act. We have the primate, cap, Captive Primate Act. Um, those are some policy things that we need to think about. And and that's, you know, I think the legal piece and the demand piece, like we were talking about, um, people wanting to go and hold a chimp or hold a, or sit by a tiger and take a selfie. Um, a lot of that is legal. And that's that's one of our biggest challenges. So it's not only tackling the illegal trafficking. Um, a second point I wanted to make is things like talking about messaging and, and people's attitudes is, is I was thinking about um, having certain pets. I was thinking, it, you know, pet parrots for instance in the u.s still very very common not even looked at it not even frowned upon i mean obviously i think most of us here would think whether it's legal or illegal that's it's horrible to keep a a parrot who lives 60 years in in a cage um 
or clip his wings. Um, so I think even thinking about attitude changes about things like that. And, um, and then the other thing I wanted to just bring up, which someone just kind of mentioned that is something that we do here about messaging is, is putting, taking it out of the context of wildlife. Um, a lot of times people here will argue about, um, uh, about the fact that, oh, well, wildlife crime isn't really crime or these guys aren't really criminals and this is our culture. And then I say, but, but it is illegal. And then they say, but, but it's different. And then I said, but what about drugs? So then I'll just take it out completely out of the wildlife context and say, if somebody were selling drugs here and they sold drugs to your family and, and, you know, do you think that when they got arrested, they should be told it's, it's okay because it's just kind of something you do. And, and they say, no, absolutely not. You know, or, they say, oh, we can't try that case because it's just about a chimp or it's just about a pangolin. Um, and then I say, well, but what if the person had murdered someone or what if the person had abused a child? Um, and they say, oh, absolutely not. Of course that should be tried. And I said, well, it's equally illegal. So I think, you know, there's so many different points and so many different um, pieces that are coming out in this conversation. And I'm only just throwing those out there because I think those are great things to be thinking about. And everybody's kind of started talking about them um, all the way through these presentations to, to just have our you know, thinking caps on about all of this stuff um, while we're brainstorming because it all plays into the same, the same place. Um, and so thank you. Thanks for giving me the, the table for a sec. Yeah, I think that the, the legal illegal, when I read that article that you all worked on and the, the game with American Mary, the, to the, under the thinking about what was legal le versus what was not legal and the social implications of them, I thought that was an interesting you know, thinking about that, because, you know, there's some that have high pressure, some that are legal, you know, thought it was a really interesting way to keep that whole perspective in there, because they feed each other. Okay, fantastic. Um, does anyone have any other questions for, for, for Wendy? Okay, um, Wendy, I might ask you a question, if that's okay. Um, sure, sure. Just your own amazing career in, in science and in STEM, do what kind of like advice or guidance would you give to you know the young people in you know, university looking to enter into this field? Because there's um I know, I know everyone I spoke to a few you know um, graduates before it can be quite difficult to you know forge a career in wildlife trafficking or you know using science. But yeah, I'd love to hear if you had any sort of advice to people looking to come into this field. Sorry, um, I couldn't unmute. Um, I think, you know, it's passion. Right? If you're going to spend your life with something, if you're going to get educated, if you're going to do all sorts of things, you know, follow the passion. And these are things that I think are young people, I think opportunities like, like conservation, whether it comes from the, the conference conservation perspective versus the behavioral perspective versus a computational perspective, um, I think this gives people an opportunity to make a huge difference. Um, I love efforts like this because I think it trains students. They may not spend their whole life in that, but it gives them a way to start um, and to make a difference. And maybe they go on. I mean, I work in computing. Um, you know, people can get a job at Google enhancing the number of clicks, but that doesn't exactly... I mean, if you could write home to mom and say, mom, I'm going to be paid a lot of money to make you click more on Google. That's probably not. But if I if I could save the big cats as part of my life and maybe I'll have I'll move into other things, but I'll still have that as a passion and a change. I look at that as an opportunity. Um, and, and I think um, I, I'm always looking at students and thinking, you know, how do we get more diverse students involved um, when I think about STEM? Because if we have the same type of people doing, if all of our STEM people look alike, think alike, we're screwed. Um, we are really, that is not a good way to be. We need the diversity of thought. We need the diversities of experience. Um, look at this group, look at, the, look at the different perspectives. You see that you have a common goal, but you're seeing the world in such a multifaceted way. And I'd like to think that by doing projects like this, students coming through, um, having opportunities to join projects like this, to learn about this, whether they're, whether they're coming from the legal side, the STEM side, the whatever, the biomedical side, this, that gives them an opportunity to step into a new world, make a huge difference. Um, so I think 
these are these are the opportunities that can change life. Um, and especially students coming up. I know I have a 27 year old son who says, for me, mom, it's about whether we're going to survive. So, um, you know, when he he's big on climate, so he, he's worried, you know, what happens? Will he get to my age? You know, or will he be washed away in a flood at some point? He's in Boston right now, you know, getting get what 18 to 22 inches today. I don't know, Renata's probably getting snowed in to death too. So, um, but you know, but if you think about these opportunities in this way, it makes, allows them to make a complete change um, in the, it allows them to contribute to these changes as well as learning skills that can give them a, you know, give them a job that, that pays enough to survive too. Does that answer your question, Harry? It does very well. Thank you so much, Wendy. Um, and we also just have one final question, I think it's on the chats uh, from Amani. If you would like to um, ask your question. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Um, I think, as I have written here, uh, there is a need for conservationists to collaborate especially in developing countries like uh, uh, areas where uh, natural resources are fetched from. And, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 this topic that uh, Dr. Inde has talked about is very, very uh, constructive, uh, especially for us as uh, uh, junior researchers in this, dom uh, in this domain. And, and um, uh, my question will be, uh, how do we develop a model for bridging between uh, different actors uh, in, uh, in, in uh, biological data intelligence, uh, open source intelligence, like what you're doing now, and, uh, and geographical data that can integrate uh, realities, uh, like financial realities, in, in uh, and communication realities between uh, between the, the, the traffickers, the poachers, uh, so so that something strong can be built. I think this is very uh, a, a very need for us to think about, so we can uh, it, it can be productive, in, especially in areas like this, uh, like uh, uh, where natural resources. Are traffic from this is uh, it's like a question also a contribution thank you thank you for a really important thoughtful question um, it's hard um, I've thought about this question quite a bit from the health side because you know health from um, I came from the NIH before I joined NSF <clears throat> And, and health doesn't pay attention to boundaries. I guess if COVID has taught us anything, it's that. Um, and so we have to, if we're, if, we're, if we're all, if we're ever gonna get to the point where we can really defend, if we can make the world a healthier place, we need to bring, everybody needs to be on board, right? And we need to have the skills and the abilities and the training, oh, sorry, the NIH, yes, the National Institute of Health. Um, we need to have the skills and the training across the, across the world. We can't just say, you know, we have our elite system here. That's good because we need we need people with elite systems throughout. You know, or not elite systems, but high. You know, we need these high end systems across the world because the world is not. It's not. You didn't have to sail. You didn't have to sail with your sails up anymore to get from one place to another. You know, it's a couple of hours, and so everything becomes international. So um, I think this is one of the things. I mean, I was I was excited when we were working on our predictive intelligence for pandemic prevention. It's so hard to remember that. It's, I just want to say PIP, and then you'll go. I don't know what PIP is. Um, predictive intelligence for pandemic prevention. One of the things we we talked to the WHO, and they were working on things in in the in across the world to help develop things for collecting data. Because often some of the questions that, that we talk about in pandemics are happening not, not near where the CDC is operating, the Center for Disease Control in the US is operating. Um, we need to have, we need to have colleagues, we need to have 
we need to have peers around the world that are working on these problems. And that way we'll get better data, we'll get better understanding, because we can't just send people in to figure things out. You know, there's people on the ground that will understand this much better um, than, you know, they're going to understand poachers, they're going to understand a different thing. Um, they're going to understand all of this in a very different way. So um, I don't have a solution for you. And I, if I did, I guess I would have a more, I would have a better job than I do, because um, I would be controlling massive funds. But um, I do think this is a conversation. Um, I know in health, it's been a conversation with the National Institutes of Health and around the world, and now with the uh, the World Health Organization. And um, actually, it was one of the, I think it was the International Money Fund, I know, IMF, International Monetary Fund, Monetary. was talking about this too, because if you think about the world's financial systems, they got crippled with COVID. So, you know, again, maybe the bright spots of COVID are that they make everybody wake up and say, we don't live in a little teeny, we don't live in our own little world. We live in a great big world and we're all connected and, and my fate hinges on yours and yours hinges on mine. Just to build so, on that, I think that that's something that the conservation community can contribute because we work in these spaces that are often um, quite rural, quite um underpopulated right they're not always urban spaces conservation it does happen in urban ecosystems but then it also happens in in places where there might be um you know less effective federal governance sometimes they're borderless um you know and so we can be kind of like first responders we can be the eyes and ears on the ground and so um you know amani i think that you know, making sure that the the pandemic people and the financial people and the defense people know that the conservation community is a potential partner as well. It's not just conservation looking for other partnerships, but it's it's us stepping up and saying, you know, we have something to contribute to. Um, so it just gets to that holism that you've been, you know, that 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 um, Harry and Wendy have been talking about, which I think is really exciting. And I think I'll just echo that. I think that's also one of the values of bringing together all of these illicit supply chains, because then it gets the partner more aware. Oh, conservation people are there. We can we can work with them. That brings resources. It brings it potentially you know funding resources and um, staffing to to help multiple problems at once. Because I have I have a feeling. When, when you start to really look at them in this different way, you find out, ooh, there's interconnections. Yeah, I have actually, you know, connected the question, um, you know, from, you know, Wendy's talk, uh, uh, supply, uh, illicit supply network, you know, domains, such as like human trafficking, um, drug, you know, and then um, wildlife trafficking. So um, probably each um, research group or team, they, they may see similar kind of phenomena, similar pattern, like similar using similar maybe um, medium or financial sources, but uh, may, they may not kind of uh, communicate each other and somehow sharing their findings. I wonder, you know, from, you know, when the your standpoint, well, since you may have more opportunity to see across, I, I mean, like various works under uh, illicit, illicit supply chain, um, I wonder whether do you see any kind of insight or or another aspect would be how can we as a kind of whole community to um, communicate or share our knowledge? Yeah. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, I think there's been a couple of, I think there's been two meetings so far um, when this, before this kicked off, and I believe there was once where the uh, principal investigators of the projects came together, um, I think for the first round, I don't know if there's another, I mean, bringing people together has become so different with COVID that, that I know in NSF, we used to try to do things annually and we haven't been very good about annual now that we're virtual all the time and, and everybody's challenged with COVID. So we've tried to, but I will talk to my colleague. And the other thing is think about too, you know, as people involved in that in that funding initiative, is there ways that that we that would be good to communicate? Um, like I run a program where we have a Slack channel for for everybody involved in the project, including students. And there's constant conversations going around, asking questions about different aspects, different 
I was just told this, you know, because nobody has all the information and so they want to work together. Um, and maybe that's something, you know, I don't know if that would be helpful, if there is a method, if there is a way, you know, because sometimes you might ask a question and, and you know, I mean, think about the web. The one great thing about the web is sometimes you ask a question about one thing and you find out the answer and five other things. So um, I'm pretty sure that people that are all interested in these illicit supply chains might have a lot, might find commonalities and, and overlap that they wouldn't in any other way. Although I'm thinking about the article you all wrote, um, bringing together cocaine and, and wildlife and sand, that the, all of a sudden when you're doing a search, you're gonna, three different groups are gonna, are gonna pull up that article which changes the dynamics. You all have, again, you're the heroes. You've already started that conversation. And I think that's really, that's part of how that changes. But if you can think of other ways that the National Science Foundation can be helpful, let me know, because we, we really do try. All right, thank you. We have, have one, one final question, question um, from, from Jim, Jim, if that's okay. okay. I'm, I'm conscious, conscious of time, time Wendy, so um, if that's, that's just, if that works for you. Uh, Jim, do you want to be far away? Yeah, I'll do it verbally rather than uh, I, than on the message board. Um, in British Columbia, we are moving towards uh, reconciliation with our Aboriginal population. And while much of the historical knowledge and wisdom has been lost due to the colonial pressures. Uh, we are now turning over some of the management of wildlife resources to the traditional uh, people in their territory or territories and they become watchers. And I think they have an innate ability to respect and hold sacred wildlife and all of nature. And I think, has that been considered as an important component in, in addressing these issues of ed education? Thanks, that's, that's an incredibly thoughtful question. And I think, um, you know, it's part of a holistic view. Um, I think if you're thinking from all the way from, you're thinking from, you know, supply all the way down to demand in that supply chain, you, you know, you, how do you protect things at the supply end, right? You have natural groups that will protect. I think a part of it is making sure people have resources that this is not the go-to response. I mean, and giving people back control of their land obviously is a resource question too, right? Because, you know, if you grow up, you probably don't say on day one, I wanna be a poacher, right? That's probably not what you say as a little child. I'm a boy, I wanna be a poacher but it may be the only thing that you can do to make enough money, right? That you can keep your family alive, survive and do things. It might be, I don't know anything about what life of a poacher is like, but I, but I know I've, I've done work in the illegal um, drug supply chain and, you know, people on the ground are not, they're not doing well. They need more resources. They need more things to do well. So I think Jim that, you know, restoring people's lands and 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 that all of the kind of cultural things that that in, includes um, is part of a resource issue. So thinking about them as protectors, but actually as groups then that have more resources too. Um, I think that's part of it. That's definitely got to be part of the solution. Thank you. Great, thanks, Jim. Thanks, thanks, thanks Wendy. Um, Wendy, Wendy, I just want to say on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for that. That was incredible. And uh, thank you for spending your time uh, answering all the questions. Um, you did an amazing job. And it's been uh, really inspiring to, to have you here and to talk about collaboration. So I just want to thank you so much for that. And um, yes, yeah, thank you for your time. Um, Meredith, I will now pass over to you to, um, to talk about the challenges. Um, thanks, Wendy, again. And uh, so when um, Meredith, uh, Patricia, and Arthur and Q will now take you through a bit more information relating to the three different challenges, and then we'll go into our panel discussion. 
Thank you so much, um, Wendy. I just want to I want to echo um, um, Harry and just say thank you for your time and um, provocation of what is uh, a really important conversation. Um, not only among the science, the interdisciplinary dimensions of science, but also the scientists. Um, and I just want to observe that you know I have the good fortune to, um, and and I know Tricia, uh, Dr. Raxter does as well. Um, we get to participate in a lot of conversations about the illegal wildlife trade and illicit supply networks. Um, and this group is just amazingly diverse. <laughs> so it's it's really cool. And I I just can't wait to um, I, I just I'm just really excited about the opportunity to learn about these different perspectives. And I hope that we've created a forum either in the Zoom chat or the Slack channels um, or, you know, DM any of us. But um, I really do hope that people feel comfortable interacting with their mentors and, and Harry. Um, we really do want to hear um, the, the the diversity of opinion. And so um, there's multiple ways to communicate. And hopefully one of them <laughs> matches your uh, matches your um, kind of lived experience and expertise. Um, so Wendy, if you're able to stay, that's great. If not, I totally understand. Um, I am going to um, share my screen now and so um what i what i would like to do is um kind of bring it to the to the to the to the hackathon um the 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 white the white hat effort that we have going on um today um so 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 welcome um you know and we've we've we're here today um, because the National Science Foundation um, has provided us with a unique opportunity to catalyze research questions about illicit supply networks and wildlife crime. Um, and so what I want to do is kind of level set a little bit um, and, and talk about the fact that um, we are uh, we're in an era of unprecedented global environmental change. Actually, can you guys see my slides advancing? Can somebody just tell me? Because I can't see you. Is that? Yes, okay. we can see. You. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank um, you. Thank you. Okay, right. So unprecedented global environmental change. Um, I think no matter where we are in the world, um, we have all uh, had direct experience and exposure uh, to global environmental change. One kind of global environmental change that we're talking about right now is biodiversity loss. And um, around the world, different species groups face different dimensions of extinction risk. Um, and so this idea of risk is really important. We're talking about um, different species, bony fishes, birds, there's insects like dragonflies, reptiles, mammals, crustaceans, all species groups have different levels of uh, extinction risk. The International Union for Conservation of Nature, the IUCN, um, is kind of the world authority on this, and they they categorize species um, according to data that they have. Um, the challenge is, is that a lot of the times we're data deficient, and so those data deficient dimensions really impact our ability to um, to understand what's happening with global extinction risk. Unfortunately, it doesn't matter what species group you're in, you face some dimension of uh, some some risk of extinction. Um, today, and a lot of those extinction risks are driven by human behavior. Um, and so that's really kind of one of the things that brings us together today. The scope and scale of environmental crime and, and illegal wildlife trade is, is growing. And so a lot of the times you hear about, uh, you know, those of us that work in the conservation space, the environmental space, environmental crime is booming. Um, it's unfortunately a growth industry. Um, it's valued at anywhere between 91 and over $250 billion a year. Um, and frankly, this is an older estimate. I think it's from, you know, at least 2019. So, um, you know, there's illegal logging, illegal fishing, wildlife trafficking, illegal trafficking of toxic wastes, illegal sand. Um, and then there's uh, all sorts of other connections that the uh, illegal environmental crime dimension kind of connects with uh, drugs, guns, um, fashion, uh, sand. Um, and so, you know, understanding the illegal dimensions and the criminal dimensions are really important. But like, uh, like Dr. Nielsen said, there's also a legal side of this. Wildlife has been traded for 
for literally since the beginning of, of humanity, right? And so wildlife can be used sustainably. Um, and there is a legal trade in wildlife and there's billions of dollars in this industry. And so we have people that are working very hard and regulators that are working very hard to um, you know, come up with fair, equitable, sustainable, um, inclusive, just ways of uh, building livelihoods off of natural resources and the environment. Um, and so um, when we're talking about this illegal, deviant, criminal side of things, it's, it's, it's highly problematic. So I think, I think what, you know, it does, it does come down to the money. Um, you know, when my, when I talk to my dad, you know, he's like, what do you do, Meredith? And, you know, I explained it to him and he doesn't really understand until I, you know, start bringing up the money. <laughs> um, the transnational crime is a booming business, no matter who you are, where you are in the world. Um, you know, so, so, so this is a graph showing different estimates, right? So the United Nations Environment Program and Interpol, like the International Police uh, Consortium, and global financial integrity have all um, invested multiple times at valuing estimates of transnational crime. And so, you know, illegal logging, illegal fishing, illegal wildlife trade, it all, the estimates vary, but it's all billions of dollars USD a year uh, that's being removed from the legal economy and it, has a number of different risks to not only ecosystems and species, but also people. So um, one of the things that I think is important to remember that I try to remember about illegal wildlife trade is like, you know, how does this influence me? Like, and the fact of the matter is, is that these supply chains connect everyone. Um, and so, you know, this is a, as a flow diagram of global uh, illegal rhino horn flows from the Center for Advanced uh, Defense Studies, C480S. In 2019, they were able to map, you know, you have rhino horns that are going from South Africa to China, from the United Arab Emirates to Vietnam, from Singapore to Laos, um, you know, from Namibia to Malaysia. Um, you know, and so there are places like like Myanmar to, to Vietnam, there are these connections, these flows um, that connect us in ways that we have never been connected before. Some of those connections are great, right? If it's information flow, if it's educational, um, you know, benefits, but then there's also disease transmission, there's dimensions of illegality, right? So these, these flows these flows connect us in ways that we've never uh, been connected before. Another way of thinking about this is global, uh, you know, trafficking by air. Um, and so, um, you know, this I think used to be more of a challenging graphic to to, to explain to people. But now that now that we're in a global pandemic, uh, it, it really is our lived experience. We truly understand how connected the world is. Um, by by global air tra by global air routes um, than ever before, right? There are hubs, there are spokes, um, there's there's different connectivities, and so these routes provide new opportunities for uh, invasive species, for pathogens, and for for criminality. So. Um, one thing that, you know, so, so what do we do about it? You know, for those of us that are interested in, um, you know, trying to build the scientific knowledge base and build evidence for action, um, you know, we're interested in better understanding the illicit supply networks that underlie, um, you know, illegal wildlife trade and environmental crime. Um, very, very recently, you know, within the past, you know, 10 years since 2007, you know, since the iPhone, you know, online activity in environmental crime is just booming. And we submitted, so um, Renata Cumin and, and Trisha and I submitted this proposal in June of 2020. So we started writing it, we, would be, we had been talking before the pandemic started in March 2020, but we were essentially writing this at the beginning of the pandemic. And we were like, wow, what's going to happen with all of this? And, and, and in the pandemic, sales have boomed. The illegal wildlife trade is booming. Online connectivity is booming. Um, and so there's legal trade, illegal trade, black market trade. Um, and so this idea of thinking about online platforms, e-commerce, social media, 
um, we don't really have a good um, scientific understanding of the illicit supply chains. There are some amazing case studies out there um, from National Geographic, the Alliance to Counter Crime Online, um, and we have many expert mentors that are going to participate in this in this um, data challenge that are going to help us understand a little bit more of this uh, these dimensions. But um, I never knew <laughs> that that these um, that these uh this this online dimension was going to be so prescient when we when we started this proposal um upsettingly right like i would have liked to have not been in this position but wow to be able to have this funding and to have groups of individuals like you all today be part of this it's it's really exciting um okay so i want to just acknowledge this is a complicated issue. The science of international global environmental change, the science of the illegal wildlife trade, it's really messy. Um, it's kind of ugly. Um, and sometimes this makes things exciting for scientists. It might be overwhelming, um, but I also am sharing this with you kind of as a motivator, right? So, so, so what do we know? Stakeholders in the illegal wildlife trade space, um, victims and offenders, they can be silent. They can be limited, they have limited societal interfaces, either because we speak different languages, because we're wildlife and, and humans and we can't, uh, you know, uh, talk to each other, um, or the victims are dead, right? And so unlike other crimes, like, you know, if I have my cell phone stolen, I call the police, I use my mouth, I use my words, um, and, and I, I, I communicate um, about these crimes. Stakeholders in the environment are often silent and they have limited societal inter, in, um, interfaces. Human behavior in the environmental space is sometimes covert. Um, and I think that we, in the wildlife trafficking space, sometimes it's overt, right? Um, for those of you that know me, um, you know that I do a lot of work internationally and I see a lot of things, right? So sometimes it's overt, it's visible. Um, and I know you all on the ground know this, you know, yourselves, um, you're good at your jobs, but also you just see wildlife crime. Um, but sometimes it is covert um, and, and, and offenders can be incredibly dynamic um, in their ability to adapt and evolve and avoid detection. So this idea that like folks are always one step ahead, it's complicating. The data, in wildlife trafficking is so fragmented. It's not comprehensive, it's unstructured, it's structured, and there's a real reluctance or inability to share data. This is so problematic for scientists because we need information that's meaningful. And so the more data we have that we can work with, the more we can work collaboratively for stakeholders, uh, for solutions. And that's one of the things that's like so amazing about this event today. Um, and, and, and so like, I don't mean to keep saying stronger together, but our efforts together are gonna really, really, really change this, this data space. Okay, so our goal um, like the, 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 the goal for this proposal, the goal for our effort was to build research capacity. We want to be better. Um, what happens when you put a team of scientists together? Um, you know, we have like, you know, Renata and Cumin, these amazing um, scientists and operations research and computer science. And then what happens when you put them with like domain experts like, you know, Trisha? Um, and and I'm kind of like a scientist with some policy making experience. So I, you know, what happens when we all work together to think about wildlife trafficking supply chains? Um, and what happens when we do this to think about it within like the physical spaces and also the virtual ecosystems? I think those are those are really like what happens? How can we build research capacity? So we're really motivated to build new teams, new teams of operations engineers, computer scientists, and social scientists to think about ways to algorithmically resolve and validate data um, to help support decision makers. Um, so decision makers at the Department of Commerce, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Interpol, um, you know, the Southern African uh, you know, uh, you know I, I do some work in South Africa, so, you know, thinking about, you know, who's, who's, who's on the ground, either police groups or rangers. Um, I know a lot of you actually do work in the legal spaces. How can science support you in doing your job more effectively and efficiently? So we observe um, at least two knowledge gaps. 
The first is that, you know, one thing that scientists like to do and science wants to do, our, our goal, like our purpose is to understand relationships. And so like, how do we understand relationships? What are the, what, what's cause and effect? Causality and inference in the wildlife trafficking space is really different, difficult to establish um, in a data universe where it's hard to see the difference between licit and illicit activity. This is just a knowledge gap, but unfortunately, this is not only true for wildlife trafficking, it's true for drugs, guns, humans, antiquities, um, counterfeit medication, fashion. So this is this is not unique to wildlife. Um, we're just focusing on wildlife uh, here. The second knowledge gap that we see is that there's this huge burden that's put on um, law enforcement authorities, commerce officials, security experts. They have they're supposed to make sense of all of this data. They're supposed to create all of this evidence and make sense of all of this disparate data um, and make sense of it for positive you know, social outcomes. And it's super hard. Um, and so this is one way that I think computer science, machine learning, um, and, and computers can really assist us um, in reducing the burden um, of combining information for public good. So we've been so fortunate to receive this kind of 18 month funding from the National Science Foundation. And we have we've had three so three workshops over 18 months. We originally thought we were going to have them all in person. Ha ha. But um, actually having them online, I think, has been a great thing because we've had so much more diversity in our participants. And so you all are part of this. So we had our first workshop. Um, I think it was like June or July 2021. And we, we, we got together and we were like, what's the problem? Um, and I know some of you were there um, and we worked to really kind of hash out this idea, like what's the problem with physical and, 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 and virtual wildlife trafficking? Now we're about to hold workshop two. Um, and, and so this, this hackathon is part of this, uh, this workshop too. What can science do about the problem? Like what theories, what methods are out there? Like what is science, like how can science help? Science is not the only solution, but we're part of the solution. And then hopefully in, in May or April of, of this year, we'll have our third workshop. And the idea here is to say, okay, now we know about the problem. Now we know about the science. Let's cultivate an environment where scientists and science can really start um, working collectively on this on this problem of, of illegal wildlife trade. So we're here as part of workshop two. So, um, you know, I had the good fortune and Trisha uh, had the good fortune to, to interact with Harry and Bright Tide um, through other wildlife trafficking efforts. And we were like, wow, it would be amazing if we could have this collaboration um, for, 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 for workshop two. So here we are today, the, the data for wildlife challenge. And um, I just thought it would be useful to sort of share some of the quotations from our first workshop, participants in our first workshop. Um, you know, as we were defining the problem, one of them said, you know, I would love to see a supply chain web instead of like a linear chain that captures the complexities, particularly in overlaying the physical and virtual crime ecosystems. Um, and so here we are today trying to collect data in support of building a supply chain web. Um, so we're, 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 our efforts today, 24 hours, are in support of this. We had another participant say, you know, well, one question that I have, like, how should we be collecting data about, you know, online wildlife crime? Who can access this data? How can we create unified data sets, um, mingling different kinds of data? How can we convert data into information so that data scientists like Cumin can can do all these amazing um, modeling efforts and understand the motivation behind the information? Um, we have data scientists that are so motivated to work on this. And they can't because we're not doing a good enough job collecting the data, um, et cetera. So um, I have not heard a consortium of trafficking investigators pooling their intel intelligence to produce both direct disruption, such as blocking cash transfers and successful prosecution of players at the highest level of a trafficking syndicate. Again, the data that we're going to be um, um, collecting for this hackathon is going to directly support that. 
So we have three challenge questions. Um, and I think you all have heard about them, but I want to kind of do some some level setting. Um, we have three challenge questions that we're trying to deal with for this this hackathon. Um, challenge question one, we're calling like data for deterrence. Challenge question two, random acts of trade. Challenge question three, media for the masses. And so what I want to do is just um, and you all um, have been. Uh, kind of you you've been put into a challenge question team you've been partnered with mentors um, we've been working behind the scenes with our mentors to try to really like drum up as good enough support for you all as you embark in, in trying to achieve these challenges um, but want to just kind of um, kind of briefly review them now so I think um, uh, if I'm correct uh, Cumin you're going to help uh, just briefly walk us through challenge question one and I can advance my slides. Is Cumin, you're gonna do this, right? You're yeah, gonna yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So I'll just um turn it over to you and and manually advance the slides. Um okay, so, great. so take it away. All right. Thank you, Meredith. Yeah. Yes, uh, it's a very exciting opportunity, and um, I'm glad to share um you know three challenges, especially I'm gonna go over first challenge, um, data for deterrence. So um Actually, when we started this, uh, um, you know, NSF project, um, I, as a data um, computer scientist and data scientist, I realized it, um, you know, um, without data in this domain or sometimes labeled data, it's hard to apply fantastic uh, scientific models such as uh, supervised learning, semi-supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning, et cetera. So lots of, uh, you know, innovation in machine learning and AI, um, you know, happened. However, you know, sometimes people misleading like, you know, we can do every magic, you know, without data. So actually, we need data, you know, high quality data. But as a um, non-domain expert, uh, labeling data or you know, collecting data is not easy. So um, we, you know, started this uh, you know hackathon. And so in the first challenge, you want, um, the goal is collect postings relate to illegal wildlife trade and trafficking on social media platforms. Um, so as you can see in President uh, document, uh, we gave an example um, from Instagram and then you know, guided, guided you how to collect the data in general. Um, so, so, and also we provided the several example articles and examples, like you know, one of them is you can see in this example, basically um, some seller, some people, uh, they are uh, posting um, um, exotic past in information with some like evidence like kind of selling or you know getting um, pets from somewhere etc so in this ch um, challenge what we are asking um, to you is to extract the following information from suspicious uh, postings so the reason I we put the word suspicious because sometimes legality legality may not be obvious um, but we try, we, we, but, you know, based on your judgment, you know, when you find, you know, suspicious, illegal, uh, wildlife traffic and related postings, you know, um, extract uh, images or videos, text emojis and um, others. Um, Meredith, would you click next slide? Yeah. Yeah, so in, in specific, you know, uh, what we are looking for is, um, you know, you, once you find the suspicious, uh, um, uh, postings, um, extract image or video, and then you know insert each posting's information into a CSV file. So each row indicating information extract from the one individual posting, and then um, provided the CSV template contain one example posting's information. So um, you can see you know what information we are um, asking. So um, in, in specific, you know what we are looking for is you know, platform name, and then posting URL, basically URL of the posting that you found. And then since we ask you to uh, download image or video um, associated with the posting, um, we sometimes a posting may contain multiple images or videos. So we ask you create a folder, one folder for each uh, posting. Um, so, and then you can basically put the folder name and so that we know uh, first row, uh, basically in, the, in here, second row is associated with the folder name index and index one. And then next column shows the poster name and then like number of likes and posting date. And then, you know, the collecting time, you know, basically maybe today so that we can see 
you know, when you actually um, access the posting and then when the posting was actually posted. And then you can see the post URL is basically the poster, the user who posted that posting, you know, so that actually in the future, when we go back, we can also collect the posters, um, other postings, so that we can understand what interest, what kind of interest, what kind of activity the poster do. So that's why we ask posters URL. And then the next one is actually content, the text. And then since we don't know, you know, why you um, collect, why 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 you think that the posting is uh, illegal somehow at some degree. So we want we are asking some evidence, right? Why you know some word or terms that. In the post in the posting why you think it's a kind of illegal stuff and then you can additionally extract the images and then if you find other information you can also put it in, in the other columns yeah that's all thank you thank you so much come in i must apologize for blowing my nose without the um thing you did i'm sorry um question two is really really exciting um, and kind of complements question number one, um, but kind of builds on it. And so to um, help um, qu explain challenge question two, I'm going to turn it over to um, Renata. I just want to tell you, I can't see the chat. Um, okay. Um, I see they're personal, so that's fine. Um, if you have questions about the challenge questions, why don't we take them to Slack? Um, and we have many of our mentors um on this call right now and so they can they can that can kind of be going along in the background um okay so um challenge question two um renata um why don't you take it away so this um builds on challenge question one and it and also i think really speaks to what um, wendy was speaking about uh, especially the demand side and challenge number two is is really recognizing that there is a supply and demand um and the supply and demand movement occurs both physically and um, virtually. So, so, you know, if you think the physical supply, like somebody has to poach the animal, transport the animal, you know, is it through ship? Is it through an a, a airplane? Um, and then deliver the animal to, or the animal product to the consumer. So that's kind of the physical supply. Um, there's, there's also the, the demand and, a lot of that occurs virtually. Um, so, so po these postings, um, which Kuma just spoke about in in, in um, challenge number one. So there, there, there's people posting, "I have this for sale." People saying, "I want this animal." You know, I want to purchase this animal. There's negotiations. There's, um, you know, financial flows, which Wendy alluded to, um, to enable all this. So there's there's both this physical world and virtual world. And there's a supply and demand, and really a challenge is, is bringing all this together and, and painting a picture uh, of what is going on. Um, and is there another slide, with, uh, Meredith? Or no? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we, you know, so, so this was just, a, a, you know, an, an example of for challenge two. We listed some examples of e-commerce sites. Um, you know, who's asking for for products? Where are they asking? Um, you know, how are these things being transported? We, we did provide suggestions of, of, of areas to focus on, but it's, it's really up to you. Um, and then next, next slide. Oh, sorry, back up. <laughs> sorry, I thought there was another, another picture. Um, but we also ask you to think create creatively. So yes, there are these known e-commerce sites, um, but, they're, but really this challenge is about thinking create, creatively about what can represent either, you know, indicators of physical flow or um, you know virtual demand and you know thing, thinking about thinking creatively creatively about you know are there indicators that could indicate move, movement or you know a potential source or predict where the demand is going to be so things like maybe there's a, a been um, a severe de deforestation in an area maybe there's um, severe economic depression in another area and and people are looking for economic um, opportunities which i think was brought up in, in the earlier question period um, so challenge number two is really about identifying these what may be unrelated or you know seemingly kind of like out there data sources and explaining why you your team thinks um, these sources could be indicative of supplier demand patterns. 
And, you know, for challenge number two, we just ask for a, like maybe a, a short description. Um, but if you're able to somehow correlate to, you know, quantitatively correlate to, to data sources, that'd be great as well. So I think that's it for challenge uh, two. Thank you so much, Renata. That was awesome. Um, and then for challenge question three, um, uh, Trisha is going to offer us a little bit of detail about that. So um, Trisha, take it away. Thanks, Meredith. Yeah, so for challenge number three, this is really about um, identifying information that's in the public domain about offenders. Uh, it might surprise you, but often, uh, well, number one, wildlife criminals almost always reoffend. Uh, repeat offense is a is a key typology with wildlife crime. Uh, but the more surprising thing is that even when folks are convicted of wildlife crimes, when they're named in media, they're named in public records, there's not necessarily an easy way for law enforcement or analysts like ourselves to find that information, uh, especially in the transnational space. You know, these criminals are hopping all across the globe, uh, trading in wildlife, and there's no easy way for law enforcement to sort of track them necessarily or to understand what they're doing, the roles they're playing, et cetera. So what we're really hoping to get out of this is um, an ex exemplar data set, you know, collecting relevant data from uh, news and media sources. If you can figure out how to access public records on arrest, that would be amazing, though I think that's uh, super challenging, much more challenging than it should be. Um, but to find a way to, you know, identify key information that's often embedded in these articles, uh, which can tell us something about the actual names of offenders, which would be great to know, of course, but uh, the wildlife they're trading, the routes they're taking, obfuscation techniques, are they uh, hiding pangolin scales mixed in with ginger uh, or other, other commodities that can throw off you know, sniffer dogs or whatever, any any type of information like that that can, when we analyze it, uh, really point to key trends and typologies that perhaps reading a couple articles here and there aren't going to really point to. You know, in the, the slides that Meredith showed earlier, depicting routes, for example, from, you know, Laos to Malaysia for rhino horn, all of that kind of information was pulled out of media, you know, but imagine the collective power of, uh, an AI tool that could then look through, you know, instead of the hundred articles I can look through as an analyst, thousands of articles all over the world in different languages, you know, what we can really understand. And a little bit back to Wendy's point too, about looking at wildlife crime as this complex uh, phenomenon, right? So we're not only thinking about the offenders because we want to arrest and punish them. We also want to think about, you know, who are the offenders? Why are they offending? What's uh, what's driving them? You know, I imagine that if we can create a media aggregation tool that can, you know, pull out these trends and typologies that there might, we might learn things that we didn't even know we can learn right, about motivations, about what's driving folks to commit wildlife crimes. So anyway, I think this is a really exciting area. It can help us understand criminals and hopefully it can help predict where wildlife crimes may occur next uh, kind of thing. So I don't know if that explained that very well. I hope it did. But again, like Meredith said, feel free to ask questions in the, in the Slack channel. And we just are super excited about working with y'all. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Here are just some complimentary uh, pictures. Um, so I just, we're gonna talk about this uh, more later, but I just um, wanted to make sure that all the participants knew, know that we're just like so, again, I'll stop repeating myself, but we're so excited that you guys are here and we have amazing mentors for you to be able to work with over the course of the next 24 hours. Um, so I really personally hope that just like the whole experience is a win for you. Um, but if your team is motivated for the grand prize, these amazing um, opportunities to be mentored by diverse um, professionals around the world, um, we're gonna offer some, some judging criteria. Um, we have like a rubric that we can provide more details um, about kind of what this means, but we're gonna kind of rank each team one low to 10 high about the amount of data collected, accuracy of data collected, depth, um, supporting documentation, resource utilization, um, kind of like the design, scalability, and compatibility. Um, and so hopefully these uh, criteria are not um, uh, um, 
much of a, like a surprise for you. Um, we really are trying to um, benefit everybody in, in this. And so um, I just wanted to put this out there um, for now. Um, and then I'm just gonna say thank you. Um, thank you to you all. Thank you to everybody um, that's that's been here for now. And we have an opportunity to segue over into an amazing um, panel um, discussion now um, that I have the amazing fortune to to moderate. Um, and so um, before I turn it over to our panelists, um, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. And Mary, okay. the, um, there is a question. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so um, is each judging across each challenge or each sub team? Um, for example, the technical ask. Okay, so Harry, can you help with this? I think it's each team. Each uh, right. sub each, each each sub team, yeah. So um, yeah, so each sub team breaks into each challenge will, and, and each challenge will be different in terms of how we judge the criteria. Thanks. We have so we have a general um, channel for uh, a Slack channel. So please, like, we can we can we and I and I did hear the Slack thing bumping while I was talking, but let's keep like asking some of those questions on chat on, on Slack for sure, but we can also put them put them in the chat here. Um, Harry, can I just do a quick check in with you for time um, in terms of the next steps? Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, we're, we're doing we're doing okay. We're, we're a little bit um, running over the original timeline, but I think we can go straight into the um, guest panel now. And okay. um, yeah, all, all good, far away. Okay, that's excellent. Um, so I am just going to, um, you know, start by just acknowledging the fact that we have an amazing, amazing um, panel discussion for you all on on wildlife crime. I um, am in a room with giants: um, Andrea Crosta, Elisa Davies, um, Lionel Hackerman. Chris Andrews, Patricia Tricor. I'm sure that I'm not pronouncing your names right, and I, I, I apologize for that. Um, what we're going to do right now is, is um, learn from people on the ground, in the trenches, working on this issue. Um, and and I'm, just, I'm just honored to be able to have everybody here. So um, our first presenter, um, Andrea uh, Krostra from uh, the executive director of Earth League International um has just an amazing set of lived experiences and expertise and so um andrea i i um very much welcome you to 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 our discussion and i just want to say thank you personally for your leadership and all this space and we're so happy that you can join us for this uh for this hackathon um do you have screen sharing capabilities or do you do you need anything from me uh, yes. Hi, everyone. Very, very happy to be here today. Uh, let me try if I can. Do you see it? Yeah, that's perfect. Um, perfect. So I'll just monitor the chat and and um, and I we're here for you. And just perfect. thank you again um, for thank you for the invitation. Today. <clears throat> so thank you very much, uh, Harry and, and the team for this opportunity. Once again, uh, in this this time to be a part of data for wildlife and to contribute uh, with my experience in, in wildlife crime at uh, the collective, uh, I think that the collective mind power of uh, of these hackathons of these exercises are uh, potentially very important. So I'm very happy to help you in any way I can. Um, Today, in preparation of, of, of the work that you are going to do um, with this very short uh, presentation. Um, um, I'd like to simply highlight the complexity of wildlife crime, the different kind of data uh, out there, maybe data that you will, on, on which you will not work, but it's it's important for you to be aware that this, there is also that kind of data. And also I would like to briefly touch um, an important topic for me and for our, my organization, which is convergence, convergence with other crimes, uh, which is again, you will probably not touch it, but it's it's important for you to be aware of it. Um, for just a couple of words uh, about Earth League International, um, uh, for those of you who don't, you don't know who we are, we are specialized in researching and collecting information on 
international environmental criminals and, and wildlife traffickers. Uh, their trafficking uh, uh, and business networks, including the uh, legal business that sometimes they have, and uh, uh, and the illegal supply chains. We, you can say that uh, if you want to oversimplify what we do, but it's I think very important, very very close to to reality. We are we address the who and the how. We are in, we are interested in the who and the how. So who are the most important players? working operating on these illegal supply chains and how they do what they do um, so we're actually mapping them we are in the process to map them all over the world we we have many on, on our database we are trying to engage most of them directly with our teams and to extract uh, um, interesting information uh, data uh, straight from them so straight from the traffickers. so it's and 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 one day maybe our data will complete uh, uh, the data on which you will be working. Um, so, um, so our research and investigative work is focused on those international trafficking networks. We don't stop there, but let me tell you this. So, I, I, I've been working in conservation for uh, over thirty years now, <laughs> and uh, and in this specific space, environmental crime, uh, at least a dozen years, and in my opinion. When we talk about data and what what we know and what we don't know and what is actually what we're actually doing, uh, this is the problem. Uh, so there is no data on some key elements on the supply chain. So there's a, in my opinion, there's a global information gap. That, by the way, we had uh, we, I recently had uh, a couple of calls with two different. Uh, uh, federal agencies in the in the in the U.S. and both of them acknowledge this gap also from their side. So, on this graph, on the on the blue box left and right, you see uh, you see what you know. We we uh, collectively, everyone, NGOs, governments, donors, media, we have been we focus mostly on on those blue box for the past decades. On the one hand, we have what is happening at ground zero, so poaching and so anti-poaching activities, working with local communities. Of course, it's a very important, very important set of activities, but uh, you know, anti-poaching buys time. That's that's all. It's not even a deterrent anymore, in my opinion, because it's too profitable. So it just buys time, which is super important. But it does that. On the other hand, you have advocacy, you have public awareness campaigns, you know, talking to consumers, especially in Asia, also super important activity. And we also do that, but it's a very long term. And it, that my personal opinion, in the past 10 years, we, we didn't see you know, a lot of results. In the middle, there, this is where there is the gap of information of all kinds. So the illegal supply chain, international trafficking networks. Who are the big players? How they do what they do, and the conversion with other crimes. So my organization work on the red box, and uh, and I'm sure that exercises and hackathons like this one of today might uh, help a lot also on to, to you know to get more data and address better the red uh, the red box. Um, when you research environmental wild and wildlife crime. Um, also during hackathons like today, there are many things, many elements and variables to keep in mind. Um, so uh, there's, there's no time to, you know, before that, you know, they, they were presented very well before me, so I, I'm not repeating. Um, let me just highlight two very important ones uh, to keep in mind while you do what you do. The first one is it's complex. It's it's not simple. Um, the current narrative out there, in my opinion, is a bit outdated and incomplete and tends to oversimplify something that is not simple at all. It's not just about poachers killing animals and then maybe resell it to a park to a middleman and then it, voila, you find this product either online or in a shop uh, uh, in, in, in Asia, for example. It's not that simple. Uh, the supply chains are complex with different actors and agents. Uh, they do different things, and it's usually very difficult to identify the guys at the very top. Hence, unfortunately, the focus on small fish and, and low-hanging fruits. So keep in mind this. The second uh, important thing to uh, keep in mind 
is convergence. What is convergence? Convergence is the convergence of environmental crime with other crimes, but also there are other kinds of convergence. So at the highest levels of environmental crime, there is a significant convergence in terms of species, traffic, in terms of different kinds of environmental crimes, and in, the, and in terms of different crimes. We have a top, first, with our organization, we have a ton of first-hand information on this topic. In fact, uh, we are going to publish, a, hopefully in a couple of months, a very interesting report on uh, convergence, all based on, uh, on the evidence that we have collected in the past four years, more or less, mostly uh, in the Americas. Uh, and I can assure you that at the top, wildlife traffickers in the world have their hands in many, many things, including legal businesses. And money flows everywhere. They use all kinds of ways to move money. Um, for example, in the past, uh, specifically in the past year and a half, uh, we saw many of our main targets uh, uh, shifting almost completely to cryptocurrencies. And uh, not all cryptocurrency, they like uh, two of them. And, uh, <coughs> and uh, but we saw this. So it's also important to try to. Uh, understand and to keep in mind maybe we are not now able to uh, with this exercise to to address those specific uh, um, elements but it's important for you to keep in mind so we have three kind of convergence multiple species convergence meaning the same traffickers trafficking network the same people trafficking different species at the same time just to give you an example if you meet them like we do during the same meeting they can offer you Jaguar parts, shark fins, seahorse, and timber at the same time. It's just a commodity for them. The second convergence is different kind of environmental crime. So many of our, of the people we, we follow and research around the world are into illegal logging, illegal mining, illegal fishing at the same time. And, and finally, there is a, a multiple transnational crime convergence, meaning the same people and the same networks are into also money laundering, human smuggling, narcotics. So it can happen because it happened to us. We have video and audio evidence that we share with different kinds of law enforcement. During the same meeting, the conversation can easily shift from wildlife trafficking, oh, I have uh, jaguar fangs and I have three tons of, of shark fins and I also have timber to, let me explain how we launder money and how we smuggle people. And this is now very common. Uh, the, the, our evidence, our work is an evidence-based work. And I, I know this is not, maybe will, maybe not, but maybe is, this is not the kind of data that, on which you will work. But you, again, keep in mind, there is the, the other, the other <clears throat> another side of the story. So we collect all kinds of data, um, photos, name, addresses, phone number, bank account, comp. Of course, we use a lot of uh, very often undercover devices. So we capture videos and audio and, and everything is then passed to our analyst. You have to imagine hundreds and hundreds of hours of conversation in different kinds of languages that have to be translated and transcribed. And then the analyst extract all kinds of information. Then we become really good friends with these traffickers. So we remain in contact that they keep sending us stuff. So, one day, uh, you know, we'll, uh, as, as uh, before it was mentioned, uh, if I remember one of the points, that the, one of the challenges that we have collectively is this, uh, uh, we, we, are, we are not really sharing the information the way it should be shared in order to be useful. Uh, and it and partially comes from a, a, a very uh, highly competitive space among NGOs, especially some NGOs. So this is a problem that in my opinion still have to be addressed and solved uh, because information now is not just as, as uh, it was mentioned before, uh, you know, unstructured and scattered around the world, but also very often in, in silos. Uh, we do our best to share information with our partners, but it's not always possible. Uh, analysis and dissemination, uh, uh, especially the analysis part, but also the dissemination, who knows, is part also, I think, of your exercise. Uh, <clears throat> in our organization, we do different kind of analysis using different kind of software, crime analysis, of course, social media investigation. Uh, there are out there a bunch of softwares that help you to uh, connect the dots and understand if 
this guy that I met in the field is actually connected to that guy online and to and to that shop online. So because don't forget that behind the, the online presence, there is always a physical presence. There is always a physical supply chain. We also do a lot of cross intelligence, cyber and field. And we also have a, a partnership with Esri, which is a, one of the leading technology companies in the US for geospatial um, intel and analysis. And geospatial is very useful, especially when you put together confidential reports, law enforcement, where you want to highlight uh, the convergence of different kinds of crimes and, and, and activities overlapping. Um, this is a snapshot of what we are dealing with at the moment as an organization, in the, especially I would say the past five years, five, six years. So we have around 250 person of interest uh, in, on our, in our databases of which we think that at least 70 of them are key targets. So some of the most important wildlife traffickers in the world. We are researching around 30 criminal networks. And as I mentioned before, we address, we, we research, we investigate, we collect evidence. Evidence is very important on, on three convergences, species convergence, environmental crime convergence, and serious crime convergence. Drilling down a bit more, this is our work in the Americas of the past four years. And you can see how complex becomes immediately. So the lines that you see, the, the links that you see are not random links, are links that we found out talking with the traffickers. So as you can see, there are links uh, uh, regional. So from, from, from the, the commodities and the products are moved, for example, from Bolivia to Peru, from Peru to Ecuador, and then exported uh, uh, internationally. They go from South America to Central America, from Central America to North America, including the United States. So it's very, it's very complex. I would like to uh, highlight also here on the, on the um, upper right side, you will see non-native species. So twice last year, traffickers in, the, in South America offered to our team non-native species, tiger and rhino. And, uh, and, and the first time I was so surprised that I thought it was a mistake. So I asked my team to go back and ask again. And then we, they come up with the pictures and they were not part, they were not tiger parts or rhino horn, uh, horns in South America. They were in Asia and in South Africa. But again, tell, it tells you how easy it is for these people to collaborate globally. They are in contact with each other. So a trafficker in Ecuador is able to offer rhino horn and is actually in South Africa on its way to Malaysia. And this is again, another thing to keep in mind. It is complex. And drilling down once even more, I, I thought uh, <clears throat> uh, to give you uh, an example of, uh, of uh, let me introduce you to one of those networks and one, and one of these uh, gentlemen. Uh, just to give you an idea of, of, of what they do and what is behind what you see online. So this is a, we call it SA8 network. They operate all over the places. We have been researching this network for at least two years. On the right, you see a partial crime map of this network. Uh, we have information on detailed information on almost all the people you see in the crime map and exactly how they work, with whom they work. Multiple species converges. This, this, this network is able to put together, according to them, uh, at least a container a month uh, of shark fins. They also traffic either kind of other kind of seafood, like seahorses, for example. They offer to us in one single meeting 300 jaguar fangs, which is, you know, 75 animals and they collected this in six months. It means that in a year, the, this, this person is able to provide the, uh, or, or is actually behind the poaching of 150 jaguars. They also offer rhino horn. Multiple crime convergence, hey, they, they don't do wildlife. They don't just do wildlife because everything is money for them. And once you control the supply chain, one, once you know how you move around in ports and seaports, you want to be everywhere. So. This, they are big money laundering guys. They launder more than $70 million per year, according to multiple conversations we had with them. Of course, it's not just money from wildlife, it's money from everywhere, including organized crime. And as you can see, they also make a lot of money uh, from human smuggling. Uh, this is an example. Sorry to interrupt. Just, just two minutes left. That's okay. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm finished. Just last slide. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, 
so this this is a, a, a again again an example of species convergence. They offering rhino horn and jaguar fangs and sharks, and then on the right there are seahorses. And this is the last slide. I just wanted to show you with whom we are working at the moment, uh, governmental agency um, and intergovernmental agencies as well. And, and I'm showing this not only to explain that to, you know to show you that we do share information we routinely confidential information with this with this agency, uh, with two of them, Fish and Wildlife and Homeland Security, we also have joint operations at the moment going on. And but I show you this because to to, you know, to tell you that um, it's, it's those agencies need our help. And some of them are open to work with, uh, you know, to, they're open to private public collaboration. And so maybe one day the exercise your your exercise today you know that what they're going to do today will will also help them to better understand uh, um you know what's going on for example i can tell you uh, but for a fact because i just talked to them that in canada fisheries and oceans are really really interested in what's going on online in canada again so there's a there's a there's a client for them uh, for you guys uh, there thank you very much Thank you so much for that, Andrea. There's so much amazing information um, that you and your organization um, are working on. And I think that this idea of convergence is really, really important, um, not only for what's happening on the ground, but also as the way that we think about the problem. Um, and so I think it's like really holistic. It's very, um, it just shows how many different touch points there are across this across this problem and also just the diversity of species that's involved yeah. um so thank you for that yeah, um right. harry sorry for time should we i know we had a few questions for andrea do you want to have now or do you want to hold to the end um i think, I think we can hold all the questions to the end if that's, that's okay, okay. Right. I mean, we can we can go through them but i, I just, just want to say, say thanks, thanks andrea. Andrea. That, was, that was amazing it's amazing <laughs> Um, thank you so much. Um, and I'm really excited to have our next speaker who's going to offer us um, some information about parrots. So Alicia Davies, Davies is a wildlife trade specialist with the World Parrot Trust. Um, and take it away. We're really excited to hear about your, um, your perspective and, uh, and experience. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Meredith. And just thank you everyone who's been involved in organizing this. I'm really, really excited to be here and just excited to provide any knowledge that uh, I can provide on this specialist area. And I'm so excited to see what people come up with this weekend. It's gonna be fantastic. Uh, can everyone see the slides okay? Brilliant. Uh, just to give a bit of background, uh, so I'm working as a wildlife trade specialist with the World Parrot Trust. Uh, I started working with them through my dissertation, uh, which was on the trade in West African birds on social media. And I've spent the last two years doing a lot of monitoring and investigation of the trade in birds and particularly grey parrots on social media and particularly Facebook. And so I'm just going to try and provide some of the things that I've experienced and learned from that period. Uh, so going right into it. Um, so I've been involved in a few uh, studies, uh, mainly based off of Rowan Martin, who's one of my colleagues at the World Parrot Trust, looking at parrot and bird trade on social media. Um, and just to give you insight of some of what we've got from that research, uh, we've been able to look at sort of activity over time, uh, which can be an indicator of real trade, but also how behavior is changing on social media. Um, we've been able to extract trade routes, uh, particularly like airlines, and that's led to direct advocacy. And we've also done some research on engagement. So if you've got a social media post, who's commenting, who's sharing, and where do they come from in the world? And that has led us to kind of look at certain regions that we might not otherwise have thought of. Um, in terms of the survey strategies we've used, we've uh, done retrospective data collection, where from a time period, we've just collected uh, all publicly visible posts that we can access from that period. Uh, and while a lot of the literature involves using key search terms to identify relevant pages, groups and posts, um, our approach was actually intelligence based. And so the initial 2018 survey uh, involved identifying individuals who we knew beforehand were major players in the African grey parrot trade. And then from that point, 
um, we'd have that initial sample and then we looked at people who commented on those posts, who shared that post and from there had this sort of snowball sampling approach where we built this large, well not me in that one, but uh, they built this larger network uh, who were involved in the parrot trade. Uh, I did something similar when I looked at the trade in West African birds uh, in that I looked at people who had commented and shared posts. Uh, and then gathered uh, the location that they reported on their profile that they were from uh, to get this understanding of the sort of uh, the geography of who was engaging with this content. Uh, but something that we did realize from doing this, and because we did it as an intelligence based approach rather than a sort of search term based approach, was that a lot of posts uh, weren't explicit adverts. They didn't have terms such as for sale or even available. And often they didn't have like key uh, species terms either. And sometimes no text altogether. And so we were quite concerned uh, that this would pose a problem for being able to find these posts if you were relying on just uh, search terms uh, and also being able to interpret them. Often these were on people's personal profiles where they were uh, sharing lots of other kinds of content too. And when the context isn't clearly trade related, how can you interpret a post as promoting and facilitating wildlife trade uh, in the absence of this text? Um, so for example, this screenshot was from a video, a live video giving a tour of a pet shop. There was no text on it, and so it wouldn't necessarily have come up, uh, but it did show trade in wild sourced illegal uh, trade in African grey parrots. Uh, and this point, this problem is within the wider context, um, which I think has already been mentioned, of traders on social media becoming more careful with more attention on this problem, um, often traders are now avoiding search terms, they're linking people to more private channels. Uh, and on certain groups, there are instructions on which terms to avoid or how to lay out a post so as to avoid uh, automated systems that might already be in place. And so this is obviously prevents a massive problem. So we wanted to look into this more. And so we took the sample that we collected on trade in West African birds, which was both legal and illegal. Uh, and for each of those, we, went through these different sources of information, the profile, the imagery, the text and the comments, and we looked for indicators that could potentially tell you that this was a post that was promoting or facilitating trade in birds. And what we found was that text was actually not all that common. Um, this is from specifically posts that did not explicitly advertise. They were not explicit adverts. They didn't have terms such as for sale or available. And in these ones, um, yeah, text, there was not many cases where there was a, the species name was there or we're even talking about importing or exporting. Instead, a lot was in the imagery. Uh, and in this case, the profile provided was a major source of context for understanding these. Uh, so for example, the profile might have a profile picture of the person with you know, bird trading boxes, uh, or it might explicitly say like import export and that provided broader context. Uh, so what, what conclusions did we take from this? The main conclusion we took from this is that there is so much information from different elements of social media that is vital for identifying and interpreting uh, wildlife trade posts and particularly illegal wildlife trade. Um, and that we need to be triangulating these different sources of data and finding like creative ways of combining and interpreting this data. I'd love to go through all of this in detail. I don't think I've got time in my 10 minutes, uh, but this is a framework. Uh, these six types of data is a framework that was proposed by Toivonen et al. 2019 for the different sources of data. Um, and I think the main takeaway with this is that we can triangulate this different information from like within a post to interpret it, but also from across posts. So say for example, on a social media page, you've got a, a live video and it says birds for sale and it shows a, a facility. There might be other videos on that same profile showing the same facility, which don't have that for sale context. But by being able to extrapolate from different elements, you can find this sort of more hidden content, if you will. And this is so important for things like understanding where the location is, uh, certain sources of information might not be reliable if they're, if they're self-reported, and also for understanding whether it's a legal trade. So the, the location, the timing of it's gonna be very important. Um, 
uh, the comments uh, can be an incredible source of seeing whether it is a trade post uh, because they may be conversations in the comments. Um, and before I end all of this, I want to just point out some of the major challenges uh, that I found uh, that I think you would just take on board whilst you're doing this challenge and more broadly. Um, one is clearly distinguishing between uh, illegal and legal wildlife trade, in this case, wild caught and captive birds. Uh, this can be really challenging when you've only got when you've got the, the imagery isn't great quality or you've only got a small number of birds because some of the indicators can be quite unreliable and variable. Uh, another really important thing, and this is something to note for challenge one, whether you're in the interpretation of the language. While the term wild can often be put with parrot adverts, um, and it may not mean they're from the wild, it may mean that they're just not socialized or they're aggressive. Uh, whilst terms such as easy to tame uh, may be much more accurately connected to them being wild sourced. So it's so important that we have this sort of different context in this research to be able to understand the most reliable sort of text terms. Um, Something more generally that's been frustrating is that uh, the redirection to more private communication channels like messaging and WhatsApp, um, particularly with the actual negotiation of prices. And so there's just some information we may not have access to because it's being moved to these private connections. And more generally with privacy settings, this is a big challenge because um, what, this, what these privacy settings and use of, for example, private stories allows is it would allow a trader to put up a public post, which is fairly innocuous. It could be a, a stock image. It could be uh, just like an image of wildlife, but behind the privacy settings, uh, they could be showing what stock they have um, out of sight of sort of any sort of detection uh, or researchers looking into this. And then framing this all are ethical issues. And I was at a conference in the last year which was discussing this about the various challenges of you know, data privacy, sharing data, collecting data, um, and the kind of issues around surveillance, which is really important to keep in mind for all of this. Um, but to sum up, I think just the main point I wanna get across is that for us to be able to find this data as we have this situation where trade is always potentially going to be one step ahead in evasion, we need both sort of expert led manual investigation uh, with the ability to very flexibly consider these different sources of data combined with automated systems that can help deal with the vast amounts of data that are out there. And these two approaches can sort of address the relative advantages and disadvantages. And I think this is why this uh, hackathon is so brilliant. It's bringing us all together uh, so that we can sort of understand those various advantages and disadvantages better and collaborate uh, together. Uh, and so that's everything I have to say. Good luck, everyone. And I'm really, really excited to hear what everyone has to say and just the discourse around this. Thank you so much. I think, yeah, we, the, the details about that kind of the flow chart that you showed, I think really sum up some of the um, challenges that we're going to face for this hackathon, but then also the realities, right? Um, and so I do believe that these are um, it, questions like Matt Smith posted, like commented in the chat. These are really uh, machine learning and 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 artificial intelligence based uh, solutions, I think, really have an opportunity to move the needle here. So thank you for that. Um, our next speaker is um, Lionel Hackman, who's the wildlife crime uh, cybercrime research officer at the International Fund for Animal Welfare, and also um, part of the and wildlife trafficking online consortium. So Lionel, I'm really excited to welcome you to this conversation. Um, I don't know how good a job I'm doing with timekeeping. So we're like about 10 minutes is great, but we're really happy to have you here. And also, could you please just introduce us, um, introduce yourself so that I that we all know how to um, appropriately pronounce your name. I apologize, uh, I apologize for that. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Meredith. And morning, afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And yeah, so that's fine with my name. Uh, so in French, we would say Lionel Achemin, but I mean, that's fine. I'm not sensitive with that. And um, yeah, thank you everyone for, I mean, the previous presentation that were really interesting. Thank you, Meredith and the whole team that 
is organized. That's super exciting hackathon. I think we are very looking forward to see some at least leads or solutions that we can look forward to really help us tackling and disrupting uh, wildlife trafficking in general. Um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to see the outcomes of this hackathon. Can you all see my screen? Right. Um, so just yes. a, a few words uh, before really starting into this presentation uh, about IFO. So IFO is the International Fund for Animal Welfare. We are an international NGO and we're more or less present in like something like 40 countries around the globe, which is really interesting when we deal with wildlife crime and to be able to be present um, pretty much from the whole supply chain or in the source countries in the in the demand markets, but also like just in the middle where the transit happens. And we also, I mean, our goal or our mindset is really to connect the dots between different stakeholders, between academia, between NGOs, governments, um, and other NGOs, and also the private sectors. And that's really, and that is something that I'm ready to discuss, but also the other presenters, the lack of, you know, collaboration or at least place that we can all work together uh, because we basically need everyone for sure. Um, and so um, IFO has been just trying to work on wildlife cyber since 2004, which is, um, it's at the same time 30%, but also quite old. Um, but I, I won't dive into the details of what, why it is important to disrupt wildlife cyber I guess you all understood it. Um, like by now, but when we talk about wildlife cyber crime, that's what Andrea also mentioned and precise. We are not just talking about the virtual place. There is like physical life behind that. We're talking about physical shops, physical animals, physical uh, person that are really involved in this um, environmental crime. To give you an idea of how we approach how IFO does approach uh, wildlife crime is we have different topics, I would say. We are doing some research and monitoring like other also NGOs, for example, like the World Power Trust. Um, but I mean, we try, of course, to complement, but the goal with research and monitoring is always to have an understanding of what is the current dynamics and trying to also understand uh, and being able to inform the right stakeholders with the right information. We are also doing some work, some advocacy work to making progress in public policy with more stricter and more adequate policy. And then we also need to make sure the law enforcement agencies have the necessary tools, but also the necessary capacity, skill sets uh, to be able to implement the legislations. And then we are also working with the general public doing some consumer producing them and when that is relevant and we're also partnering with the private sector so that's pretty much also eco what has been, have been discussed previously to have like the need for an holistic approach and we obviously also collaborate with other uh, NGOs other academia other different stakeholders uh, to try to make the most of, of the, the work that we all are doing um before just going and detailing a bit more what we're doing with the private sector, I would like just to emphasize a few points on the research we're doing, and hopefully it will help you in the work you will do uh, during this weekend. So because of the fact we have a limited capacity, we are only able to research key online marketplaces. Um, and I wanted just to show what we are doing, especially in regarding the monitoring in China, um, just so that you know what an NGO like us is able to do and what also are the limits. Um, so in China, we have a, a small team there, but they are doing some regular monitoring on platforms. They're doing, they are using a AI tool that is basically recognizing image. Um, and that's worked, I think right now for 16 different species. So that is uh, not perfect, but that is, it is quite uh, operational. I think the tool has been developed for the last three years now. And we are also we have also some research uh, with like cyber which are basically citizen scientists or volunteers 
and the different uh, monitoring activities we have have different um, purposes and we have also uh, for some monitoring really looking in depth um, for a, at least a, a few weeks or a bit more um, for other monitoring we're just trying to have an overview of what is going on to just be able to inform the right stakeholders and when we collect from the three different activities the illegal listings and at least it shows you what we can do with like the the work of identification of um post we are then like pretty much sorting the the listing this is like a simple um yeah graph but it just to show you what is uh, what could be done with that and then we are basically dividing them into two categories like the suspicious illegal listings that do not have like really criminal clues that have an integral value for them we'll just basically provide uh, this information to the online person we're partnering with uh, so that they can then work on their algorithm they can work on their policy they can also use that to improve their knowledge about what is going on on their platforms and then we are also um, providing clues and intelligence information to law enforcement agencies so that they can also like do some proper work some investigation work and so I was talking about the, the fact that we do work with the private sector. Um, they are obviously, and it has already been mentioned quite a few times now, they are obviously um, a provider, or at least a supplier of, um, this is where basically you can find uh, some illegal adverts. And that's why it's also important to work with them and it also, one might say that they also fuel the demand, which for some case is true. And so basically we have been starting working with them for uh, following a report on Ivory uh, like 14 years ago. And that's, we had the mindset of, okay, we did this report. We know what could be the next step, what could be a recommendation. So let's just provide this recommendation to the private sector so that they can also um, improve that practices as long as what NGOs are doing, what the academia is doing, what science uh, is making progress on and with governments, etc. And then we're starting working with like some platforms from there to there. And uh, three years ago, so I4 Traffic and WF uh, created what is called the Coalition Twin Wildlife Traffic Online. Basically, the main purpose with that is to, instead of looking at and partnering with this platform, this platform, and this platform, is to have this sectorial approach and to be able to have an harmonization of. Um, so, right now, we have like, yeah, 47 company partners. I know that this is not pr the perfect solution, but this is, this is like just one part of the solution to be able to work with the private sector and to also um, maximize their capacity because they do have capacities and for some of them and even most of them they do have goodwill we just talk here about businesses that may also want to do some profits and they are and we also need to inform them about what is going on but why and persuade them basically why they should change and why they should act on the environmental crisis on wildlife crime in this case and so the work we're doing uh, with the coalition is also to provide the different stakeholders uh, a place where they can also share best practices, where they can collaborate, because they they will like as NGOs, we don't really, really have the legitimacy to um, also to address to the private sector because we are not functioning in the same way. We don't have the same business model, so they might just prefer or be more inclined to listen and agree with other. Um, other um, colleagues or rivals and so the approach we have with the question is really to harmonize the policy to have strict uh, policy regarding wireless trafficking we are also helping them in the training for their employees and also using this to also do some user education messages so i know this is this ain't perfect we are we need to have some be able to change campaign to really go further uh, but there is also a need to inform uh, the users because for most, at least on the open online marketplace, um, a large majority of the users that are um, selling illegal 
um, specimens, basically they just don't know that this is illegal or they don't know that uh, where this specimen comes from. And then we are also pushing the online platforms to, um, at least for those who can, to develop some uh, machine learning uh, tools. So this is ongoing, but you all know that, but it takes time. It, it, it ends a, a magic tool. Um, and it regards to an expertise database of images and um, and yeah, but we are pushing forward also using the capacity the expertise of this big ad tech to really um, have tools that we can use to in in this purpose and yeah, just some quick results. I think the the main idea with the you may have seen this number of uh, these figures of like 11 million of uh, wildlife um, adverts blocked or removed. But I think the main message behind that is basically that this is just the tip of, an, of the iceberg. And it really shows the size of what we are talking today and the size of the problem. Um, and that's why we also need to keep pushing. That's why this hackathon is really interesting to really provide this also more uh, technical, more a computer science uh, aspect to this because we really need everyone and every expertise. And one last thing, I know I'm a bit late, but that might interest you. And that's how we, um, so basically uh, one of the benefits or one of the things we provide the company that joined the coalition is a, a keywords uh, database. So that's uh, all of the keywords that, that we use in the past um, to find illegal products. And we basically provide the online platform with these keywords so that they can include them into their algorithm. But we also continuously try to grow this database and we share it with academia when they want it. We basically um, really want to have, um, so this is a search terms research. So this is not an intelligent research and we obviously also need the other parts, um, like Alisa mentioned it. Um, but yeah, so that's basically what uh, the collaboration with the private sector could look like. It is just one part of the solutions and, um, and yeah, I hope you enjoy it. And, but the most important is just good luck to, to you to you all for this really exciting hackathon. I, enjoy, I hope you will also enjoy it, enjoy working on this type of subject. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's amazing to see what you and your um, colleagues are kind of already doing. And I really think that you are helping to set the bar for the rest of us in terms of um, what's already happening. Um, and, and so I think that your experience and expertise will be just, it's just fantastic to have you here. So thanks for that. Our next um, panelist is going to be Chris Andrews, who's the director um, at Rendered, excuse me, at Rendered AI. Chris, take it away. We're happy to hear your perspective, which is going to really um, complement um, what others are, are doing. Sure, and I, you guys can hear me, okay? Uh, you know, you might have to stop sharing your screen. Sorry. Chris. Yeah, I think line, if Lionel is, yeah, okay. And it looks like Chris. Okay, we right. see your we see your thing. Thanks, Chris. And you hear me just fine too. Okay, cool, great. So first off, uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, the, the whole panel is great. I feel honored to be uh, included amongst the folks who have been speaking so far. Um, I am going to hopefully offer a little bit different information and perspective. Um, I. I am sorry. I'm just trying to get rid of the box here. Okay, um, I uh, I've been I, I come at this from a very different perspective. Um, I am more from the tool vendor side of the world, and uh, but many of the things that have been touched on today have touched uh, a whole variety of things that I've worked on in my career. Um, I I I'm looking forward to presenting a little bit to you and then participating uh, in the actual hackathon itself. So. I work at a company called Rendered AI right now, but before I dive in there, I'd like to maybe share a little bit about my background. So I have actually been working in, I have a life sciences background and I've been working in the geospatial uh, related technology arena for many years. Uh, uh, and uh, one of the speakers mentioned Esri, uh, actually more than one speaker mentioned Esri. I actually worked at Esri for about seven years. I started out very early in my career working with Esri software 
uh, Esri makes uh, digital mapping software. And I focused on uh, 3D when I was at Esri, but I also uh, worked on around the building information modeling domain and I worked on ArcGIS Earth, uh, which has been used uh, extensively in uh, law enforcement and uh, international crime arena. It was actually built for the defense department. Um, and then I've also touched uh, life sciences and, and many other areas in my career. My focus is really on making difficult workflows possible for everyday users who don't have the time to jump in and learn deep software complexity specifically to exercise the domain knowledge that they have. Fun fact about me is that um, I believe that I'm probably one of the first, if not the first person to build an actual multi-tier internet crime mapping tool. I did this as a pretty junior developer back in the late 90s uh, when I was kind of too naive to know how difficult it would be to do it. And, uh, and it, I ended up doing this for the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. Uh, it, it, was, it is the largest city by land area in the US. And, uh, and back then they were handling almost a million calls for service a year. Um, when we rolled it out in just a few months uh, after uh, developing it, uh, and I spent, I probably built 95% of it myself, um, it was available to literally hundreds of analysts and officers anywhere in the, the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. And then it was, it was able to be used in patrol cars. Um, one of the really cool things that I got in almost like 10 minutes after deploying this was a note from an analyst saying that they had spent six months trying to pull together maps of, uh, of predators within certain uh, distance of schools. And that in 15 minutes after, after uh, being shown how to use my, the tool, they had actually solved the other six months, resolved the other six months of their investigation. So that was pretty early in the digital crime mapping uh, uh, domain, but it's, it illustrates the type of simplification of workflow that I've been focused on for most of my career. What rendered is all about is, uh, as Leonel just mentioned, there are many problems in uh, deploying artificial intelligence. Um, data collection, management, and cleaning are, are very difficult, uh, the, especially when you have data sets that are, are not rich. You end up with extremely poor uh, uh, handling of edge cases, you end up with uh, biases, and, and you end up being unable to train high quality artificial intelligence uh, detection systems. Um, biases are fundamentally related to data sets which, which feed AI. One of the uh, Defense Department projects that we've recently uh, put a proposal in on estimates that to reach 60 to 70% uh, accuracy in some of the domain that they, they're working in, they need 50 million individual images. And so you can imagine if, if the de Defense Department in the US is worried about paying for 50 million images just to, uh, just to find one particular item in, in, uh, in remote sensing information, areas like the illegal wildlife trade where there's a, a much less funding going into it than, uh, than uh, the Defense Department has are really at a disadvantage because they simply can't, you know, the groups who are speaking today simply can't pay for 50 million images to try to train an AI to detect a, a particular type of endangered species or a particular scenario. And so this data access really tremendously limits your ability to apply artificial intelligence. Uh, specifically, it limits your ability to detect rare events and edge cases. And this includes things like endangered species. Uh, it, it includes, uh, you know, criminal trafficking activity, which, you know, by definition, criminals don't want to share uh, imagery, as, as has been said today. Um, it, it also uh, you, in, you in end up with data labeling problems. Data labeling is the act of sending data out to humans to apply uh, annotation, basically identifying this is a particular type of species in a certain circumstance, and humans are not perfect. And, and uh, especially with hard to detect things or hard to, to tell the difference between things, humans can actually create errors in labeling, which, uh, which can impact the performance of AI. In many cases, if it's impossible to acquire data sets or very difficult to acquire data sets, 
you simply can't even start to design a system that would then detect rare events uh, and traffic to animals, that kind of thing in, in that system. And in the complex networks that we've seen in the presentations today, I'd suspect that there are many cases where there are hypotheses about the type of data sets that could be used, but it's really difficult to acquire them, which is why we're, we're participating in the Hackathon today. And, and this becomes a barrier to even starting to build AI to detect uh, the things you're looking for at different nodes in those networks. And of course, um, there are problems accessing restricted or high-risk data. Uh, you know, getting evidence of criminal activity, for example, can actually put people in harm's way. And, and so um, all of these things are limiting your ability to apply artificial intelligence. We are focused on this concept of synthetic data. Um, synthetic data is engineered data that is built to address specific AI or machine learning uh, training and validation cases. We are seeing that AI is becoming a pervasive business capability across many different aspects of commercial industry. And we believe that synthetic data is useful in basically every phase of AI adoption. Rendered AI enables customers to continuously explore, iterate, and develop better AI in an evolving business environment. What it means in terms of what we're talking about today is you could conceivably use engineered data to simulate data sets that you could then train AI to detect the difficult to detect things that we're talking about in these complicated networks. I, I think it's it sounds far-fetched today, but we've seen how much technology has changed over the last five or 10 years. And if you think about uh, moving five or 10 years into the future, what we're already hearing is that um, very large analyst agencies and large companies like Tesla, Apple, and others are already uh, using synthetic data to simulate uh, training data for artificial intelligence. And what Rendered is, is trying to do is move this more into the popular domain. So make synthetic data available for everyday projects and everyday uh, smaller uh, companies and, and programs who can't access the, the massive technology stacks that folks like Tesla and Apple have available to them. We actually, uh, so Gartner is a major uh, analyst group and they've put out a couple reports basically saying that they think that synthetic data is going to actually overtake uh, real data for training AI uh, broadly across the industry within the next five to 10 years. And we're already seeing evidence of that in, in some areas. What we actually think is that there's actually a job of the future, and this is something for some folks on this, uh, on this event to consider, that there will be these folks called synthetic data engineers whose entire role is to design and engineer fake or synthetic data sets to try to achieve specific AI outcomes. And these folks will be typically expert in specific data types and technologies. So uh, just as, as, uh, as Lionel was describing, for example, some of the, the, the collections of data that are required to solve some of these IWT problems would be an example of both specific data types, domain and industry expertise, and even some of the technologies that were used to gather them. If you could take that information and then from there reverse engineer artificial data sets to simulate and create larger sets of data to, uh, to try to train AI with, then you might be able to actually create detectors for certain IWT activities before you even have enough real data to go out and, and train that AI. So, so it's, it's, there's a lot of pretty exciting opportunity here. Um, last slide here, uh, I didn't want to take very long. We've already demonstrated uh, with customers in a variety of domains that, uh, that we can generate uh, a whole bunch of different types of synthetic imagery uh, with with uh, rendered AI. We are primarily focused on computer vision, so imagery, video, um, other uh, related computer vision output, but we've also uh, been able to demonstrate that we can generate text data and other things. One of the intriguing partners we work with in the lower left there is our company called Quadradox, I should say CT scan. Uh, Quadradox uh, actually built their own uh, X-ray detector on top of our platform and they've actually started to work in some, uh, some projects uh, where they're looking at using their x-ray detector to detect um, human and animal bones in, in luggage and cargo. 
Uh, there are lots of potential applications of synthetic data. These are all fake images, if, if you can allow me to use that term. So if we can if we can start to create synthetic data to say, put a lion skull or weapon or other things in, in baggage, for example, then you can actually train AI to go and, uh, and apply those detection techniques against real world data that's otherwise really hard to get. Um, sorry, that was a little bit scattered, but, uh, but uh, I wasn't sure if I was gonna be sharing my own screen today. Uh, I'll stop share here. Uh, thanks very much for your time. And I'm really looking forward to participating in the event today. Thank you so much, Chris. I think that a lot of what I enjoy about chatting with you about helps me to understand the realm of the possible. And so it's it's um, it, it helps me to kind of think about where I want to go and all of the potential opportunities for holistic collaboration here. So it's just it's really it's really exciting. And I think that um, your perspective is really going to contribute to this this hackathons, um, this impact. Thank you for that. Um, so our next speaker, um, and I, I, I'm just loving these talks, and so I don't think I'm being the best timekeeper, and I apologize in advance. Um, our next speaker um, has been a personal inspiration to me for, for years, um, not only in terms of conservation and what's happening on the ground, but also for her leadership and being willing to share data. I think that, um, uh, Patricia, I just want to, verbally laud you for really um, leading by example. And I just, you have set the bar really high for me personally, and I'm just so excited to have you participate today um, and serve as, an, as a mentor, so so thank you. Um, so with, without any further ado, I will turn it over to you, and we're really excited to hear about um, what you have to share with us. Thank you, Meredith. Those, that was a very nice introduction. Well, um, I'm glad I was left till the end because um, basically I'm, I'm very happy to see people I've worked with over time, Andrea, Alicia, uh, Lionel. Uh, it's, it's a real honor to, to be following their, their uh, on their schedule, following them. Um, I don't have to repeat what they've said because they've covered pretty much what we researchers face and what we researchers do. Uh, plus I'm the dinosaur here. Uh, and also my, my techniques are dinosaur-like, they're Stone Age techniques. But um, I just wanted to show you a slide that uh, I'm gonna ask Harry to put it on, um, just to give you an idea of the, kind of the kinds of things that we need to face. Um, Harry? Yes, I just bear with me two seconds. seconds. Yeah, I don't have a presentation, I just have a few slides that I want to show you. And just to give you an idea of who I am, I've been working on um, illegal wildlife research for the last 15 years. My focus was always cheetahs until I came across a multiple number, uh, many, many, many different species uh, that the same people I was following uh, were trafficking in. Uh, some of them even, you know, across continents. Uh, and uh, so there is, there is huge convergence in terms of um, different species, like Andrea mentioned. And there's also um, uh, the challenge that cheetahs are trafficked uh, in a region where um, there are lots of other crimes. Cheetahs are mostly trafficked between the Horn of Africa and the Arabian Peninsula where we know there's piracy, there's uh, traffic, uh, trafficking in arms, in drugs, in alcohol, in electronics, in chemicals, etc. So these are things that we know uh, exist, but we haven't been able to determine. So uh, this slide is just to show you the relevance of this um, hackathon. Uh, this is a screenshot of my one of my one of my folders in my computer. As you can see, uh, I have uh, 75,000 files in 1,056 folders plus 750 media articles. These files are all um, ads that I found on e-commerce on social media. Uh, why do I have so many? Because 
Many of the ads are repeated. I sometimes got to look at the spots on the cheetahs to make sure it's the same spots. I sometimes have to look at the furniture. I have to look at the, the whether the photos are uh, original or not. Sometimes they're taken from posts by zoos. Uh, and these are mostly, um, oh, and anyway, these are mostly uh, um, scams that, uh, you know, usually from Cameroon, from Nigeria, they're offering animals that don't exist and they want the money. So it's a very, very important thing to, to determine which ones are real, which ones are not. And that takes a lot of manual work that I hope this hackathon can, helps uh, solve. Um, the next slide will show you uh, the variety of species that, that I have found online. These are all screenshots from um, Instagram, uh, Facebook, YouTube posts, and it's just a small sample. Can we go to the next slide, Harry? Yes, yeah, sorry, my computer doesn't seem to uh, want to share the slides today. Um, it, it's that the one, one with, with chimps and, and clouded leopards and... Okay, can, is that, can you see it now? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah, so that's those are the kinds of animals I come across, even, you know, red pandas, leopards, all kinds of things. So uh, this touches upon another important point I wanna make mm -hmm. and Meredith was kind enough to recognize that I'm always sharing information. I've worked uh, on great apes projects. Um, Alicia knows that I, you know, whenever I found parrots, I don't know much about parrots, but I share with her sometimes probably things that are not relevant to her, but uh, sharing information is very important. Um, the other thing that it's important in terms of keeping track of these things and uh, how I hope this hackathon is gonna make them easier is if we can go to the next slide. And that's the last one. Um, the 75,000 files that I've collected plus all the media articles have only yielded just over 2,300 advertisement in 10 years. Uh, they were found in 23 countries. There were more than 500 sellers. Uh, all these advertisements uh, came down to about 2,300 cheetahs. Um, as I said, I've tried not to duplicate them. And 75% of all these ads were found on Instagram. The, the, next, uh, the second place was an e-commerce site that uh, is in Saudi Arabia that it's uh, called harash.com.sa but they're getting really good at deleting uh, all these cheetah ads, except right now there's one of a taxidermy cheetah there, a cheetah cop, which is, these are also things I keep because they're proof that cheetahs are dying young when they go as pets into the Middle East. So this is pretty much what I want to say. Uh, as far as, I mean, this is relevant to, I think all three challenges because we, we need to take into consideration that the cheetahs come from, from, come from a region that is poor, that it, uh, it's full of corruption, um, that is, uh, has weak enforcement and legal frameworks. Uh, then they're going across the Gulf of Aden into uh, Yemen, which is at war. Uh, and then they are distributed into the Gulf states, which are very wealthy and have very little political will to do much because a lot of the rich and powerful own these animals. So the importance of gathering data is to make sure that uh, the problem becomes uh, real, becomes credible. Uh, thanks to the data I've gathered over the years, uh, CITES included uh, the issue in their agenda uh, in 2013. Uh, recently, they decided there was not enough cheetah trade and I published 10 years worth of data which uh, hopefully is giving some credibility to the fact that the cheetah trade is happening along with other species and that these species are at risk of going away in our lifetimes. So I won't keep you longer. Um, this is all I wanted to say. Thank you so much, um, Trisha. I think this like really tees us up for what we're about to embark on. 
Um, so Harry, I might ask you for some feedback. We definitely want to like set people loose and, and, um, you know, want to, want to get hacking, but I think that there's been also so many, um, amazing things that these panelists have just raised. Um, could, do we have, do we have, we have some time for questions, I think. And, yeah, and, of course um, we do. you know, yes. I think that this is, this is really where it's at. Um, so I know that some of you had posted questions in the chat. Um, could you also just raise your hand? Um, because I want to make sure that I don't miss anything. Um, I've got, got two, two questions, questions for Andrea, Andrea straight uh, on. Yeah. yeah. Thank so you, I, thank Harry. So far off those. Um, Patricia, uh, Rax, I think you, you were going to ask around cryptocurrency. I don't know if you wanted to ask Andrea that question. Okay. Don't know if Trisha's on the call, maybe. Um, so, Andrea, it, basically, Trisha was asking, she's interested in how you might track cryptocurrency transactions and how we can disrupt these kind of transactions as well. Thank you, Harry. Sorry, I couldn't find my unmute oh, button. Don't worry. But that was my question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a very tricky subject. Um, a very interesting. I mean, what we 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 had targets uh, uh, in Latin America, for example. I can mention a few in Mexico, uh, Peru, Colombia. Uh, that two years ago they were moving gold to Dubai, just to just to give you an idea how it changed in two years. And now they are all giving you or showing you uh, crypto wallets. They use. They like to use. Uh, uh, stable coins, so tether mostly, uh, because it's, there is a one-on-one -on -one with the, with the dollar. Uh, of course, they don't keep tether because there is always you know problems of solvency. So, they, but they used to move money around and then, of course, uh, rechange it back to dollars. Um, some of these uh, targets, some of these traffickers, open crypto wallets uh, using names of locals that. So not them. So you have to imagine, uh, for example, um, a, an important Chinese trafficker uh, opening various crypto wallets using names of local Bolivians or local Peruvians or local Mexicans. Uh, so it's also even if you get to the wallet, then you don't find the guy. Um, so our work is to get those uh, information, uh, get the wallets. And also, and we, and that's the part of um, of the story that I unfortunately I cannot share with you. Uh, for help law enforcement, U.S. law enforcement, to um, try to to do things with this guy. Let's put it this way. I cannot add more uh, more information about it because we are in the middle of those operations. I can tell you that last year, uh, if I remember well more than 8.5 billion dollars have been laundered using cryptocurrency so it's a lot of money uh of course by everyone uh narco trafficking uh, terrorism uh, organized crime everyone but also wildlife traffickers because as i showed before they do all kind of stuff together so it's definitely a problem in the us they are i think in 2022 in the uh, the biden administration will put forward some legislation to try to regulate a little bit more, but in many other countries around the world, no. So that's, that, that you, um, you, you can imagine the problem. Great, thank, thank you, Andrea. Andrea. That's, that's a really great sentence. Um, I also, want, it, to add, I also yeah. want to add that in terms of uh, financial flaws and if, you know what they, you, you heard it many, way, many times, I, I, I'm sure follow the money, which yes, it's very important, but it's also very difficult. And I can tell you, we have uh, cases that we are investigating right now of trafficking networks moving money around the world to pay people or to be paid without moving money. So they use the same, uh, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Muslim, uh, you know, the Hawala, which is the way to move money in the Islamic world. So you move money, but we actually don't move money. I give you, I give a million dollars here to someone in cash and that someone will help will get back a million dollars plus interest in another country, but there's no movement of money. So this is another challenge uh, that I would like to mention. 
Great, right, thank, thank you, Andrew. Thanks so much. It's, it's so interesting to learn about the cryptocurrency element mm-hmm. and how I think uh, Trish has just pointed out how the criminals always seem to be one or two steps ahead of us. Yeah, for sure. Exactly that. Um, we also had another question from Julian. Um, Julian, I don't know if you want to ask Andrea your question as well. Yeah, I can ask. Um, yeah, so thank you very much, Andrea. It was really yeah. awesome, to be honest, uh, to hear this from you. It will be really interesting to know from you, like, what kind of techniques did you already try to use to um, yeah, map out the supply chain? So what techniques are you using and what are the most common techniques? Techniques, And is this just, uh, for example, only social media or are there also other channels? Do what, sorry? Um, to map the supply chain. Uh, so we do it. Uh, uh, we do it the old, uh, the old, the old-fashioned way. I mean, we pure intelligence operations in the field, meaning we 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 spend years in uh, infiltrating those networks uh, with real people. Um, um, we also recruit sources locally that give us information continuously. But this human human intelligence is called so you have to meet these people spend time with these people and maybe this is the one of the difference between uh, uh, short time or short term investigation and intelligence intelligence is you're in for the long term you're aiming at the top players uh, you become friends with these people we went to weddings of these people and we you know we get invited and we go and and while there they explain you everything uh, and that's how we get the information and then our role stops there of course we don't uh the, the i can tell you that without giving you details that the most important operation we are in at the moment uh, are important and potentially potentially very important only because we have a government agency of a country that is willing to do the extra mile and to and to buy something and to you know and to and to continue on the supply chain uh, if you don't do that last bit of work that we cannot do only law enforcement can do it uh, then it's very difficult to, to get to the top cool thanks thank you thanks for that question and um, patricia were you also going to say something as well yeah, I just wanted to mention uh, what Andrea said is true, and it's very important to establish a very close relationship with, with your sources, with the people you're dealing with. Just now, I'm getting a, a video of two cheetahs that just were smuggled into the Emirates, just now. And uh, I'm, I'm dealing with people who are actually cheetah buyers, cheetah owners, and they're the ones telling me who's selling them. <laughs> so. It's very important to have a very close relationship with them. Don't accuse them. Don't blame them. Uh, their, you know, their culture, their beliefs, their yeah. money, <laughs> allowed yeah. to do what they do. So it's very important to to be uh, to understand them. And the same thing on the supply side. If you have informants, you have sources. They're probably uh, risking something because there's a situation with clans with. Uh, you know, uh, networks, etc. So it's very important to to establish very good relationships with your sources. Uh, field work is very important. And the other source that I didn't mention during my talk, and I'm sorry, is the media, which is uh, the challenge number three in, in the hackathon. Um, a lot of the information I get, I mentioned 750 media articles. Uh, that's uh, where I get some information about confiscations, about who uh, was arrested, why, uh, what kind of uh, illicit goods were involved. Uh, then you also look at court records and you also look at databases. So it's, it's a huge, huge uh, you know, place where you have to compare. Uh, you don't wanna du- duplicate things. So if a media article, has something and you find the court record, make sure it's the same and not different uh, so you don't duplicate. So that's what the sources that my database on cheetahs uh, include all kinds of sources, direct open sources and uh, and field work. And and, uh, of course, e-commerce and social media.
Thank you, Trisha. That's great. And um, uh, we, we have, have Jenny, Jenny who has her hand up there as well. Jenny, I don't know if you wanted to, um, to ask a question. Hi, thank you. Um, thanks, everybody, for your talks. Um, I'm really fortunate. I'm a, the founder of Liberia Chimpanzee Rescue and Protection and Partners in Animal um, Protection and Conservation in the U.S. and in Liberia and West Africa. And um, I am fortunate to work with a lot of you who've talked today, which is fantastic. Um, but I know a lot of people don't uh, aren't linked in. And one of the things I was thinking a lot about when you were talking, Andrea um, and Tricia, we've talked about this a lot, is that um, the reporting, the reporting platforms. Um, we've talked a lot about how to collect the data and what to do with the data and how to share the data. And Andrea, I wanted to also ask you, um, you, you touched on sharing data. I know that's for us, that's a huge issue with different organizations. Um, there's so many organizations doing this kind of work, but not um, coordinating efforts and not sharing data. Some people it's just because of logistics and some people don't want to share data. So I wanted to ask you a little to, to expand on that a little bit um, because I think that'll help people when they're coming up with solutions to understand that component. And then um, I, at least I didn't hear anything about reporting. Um, we get, re you know, I get reports every day of um, primates, great apes, chimps, but also other wildlife. I also get many people writing to me to buy wildlife. Um, we are very heavily on social media, so we see a lot. Um, I'm, like I said, I'm fortunate to be connected, but many people aren't. And there really isn't a place to, a central place to report wildlife crime um, or things that you see on media. I know we have these platforms, but, but it's very hard for people to know where to start when they find out about something or someone or, or a situation. So I wanted to ask, I guess, Andrea, but also others, what you suggest on that. And to me, that's a whole other, that's a whole other hackathon, I guess. Um, but thanks everybody. Um, hi, Jenny, very nice to see you here. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's sharing, it's a huge, huge problem. And I don't know if this hackathon will be able to address it or come up with ideas or, I don't know, but it's a big, big problem uh, at various levels. Um, um, for example, uh, I mean, technically, Interpol cannot uh, accept information from us, for example. Even if we have better information than them, they cannot accept it. So there is here is a problem between a, a, a law enforcement organization and the private sector that might help, but they are not designed to uh, accept information from us. Uh, then at, the deep, at another level, um, we, I had a couple of bad experiences in the past years ago when we share information with the wrong NGO and then this information pop up on the media. And that, as you can imagine, is a huge problem. You can put, uh, first of all, the safety of our people in the field and then, uh, um, and then it can destroy an operation. Um, another issue is of sharing is, uh, you know, large NGOs, they do everything. They do from, from, dogs and cats do whales so they do everything but we do just this and so information for us is all we have is our treasure is the only way we have to get more funding is to show the kind of information that we collect and analyze so it's very difficult for us to give it to somebody else uh so uh, i i think uh, years ago uh if i remember well a foundation in the u.s balkan tried to come up with the system to where we all can share information. They were talking about adding, you know, metadata, meta information on, inform on, on our information, on someone else's information, so you can track who is the information didn't work out, so they failed. Uh, yeah. So it is complicated. We found, I mean, we uh, now, it's, it's all about trust. So for example, uh, Lionel is at the call. So we have two organizations we trust a lot. One is IFO and the other one is uh, IUCN Netherlands. We, we share with them. Uh, so at the end, you create uh, your own uh, group of organization or club. Uh, I wish it was bigger, but it's not. And that's a challenge. And honestly, I don't have a solution for this. Thanks, Thanks very much, Andrea. That's great. Um, Patricia, I see you have your hand up as well. Would you like to um, yeah, add in? Yeah, it's me again. Um, 
there's another aspect to reporting that is uh, quite concerning, and that's reporting to the uh, to the media, to the social media. Um, it's it's quite frustrating because they don't keep they don't save evidence of mm -hmm. anything. So if you report an account and you succeed in getting them to react, uh, they will remove the account, which doesn't mean that the guy is going to stop selling. He's just going to open a new account. And for us researchers, it, it turns out that you can't find him anymore. Uh, so this is another aspect of, of reporting. So enforcement or the social media, they it really doesn't work. Reporting, it doesn't help much. In the countries that I deal with in the Middle East, uh, if you're a foreigner, your reports are not uh, taken into account. That's another issue. Thanks, Patricia. And, and Elisa, I wonder if you might be able to um, add in there as well, because I remember we had a really interesting discussion around uh, what do you do with the post if you come across it that's selling wildlife? Do you, do you leave it there or do you gather as much intelligence as possible? So, yeah, it'd be great to hear more about that. Yeah, that's, I mean, over the last, you know, year or two as I've been working, because I'm actually, I'm fairly new to, so I've been encountering all these different perspectives from Patricia, from Eiffel, from all these different perspectives. And within Wild, within the World Parrot Trust, I've kind of been the person responsible for sort of gathering a lot of this data when we're following people online. And it's a real tricky thing of thinking, okay, there's this person on social media, what action are we going to take? Um, I think there's a whole that I mean, I feel like I'm repeating what everyone knows, but there's questions of do I have the contacts to in that could take this forward and actually get a viable that could viably get some enforcement uh, on the ground? Um, is that going to take too much time or is it better in this case to report it um, and potentially create some friction for that individual on the social media platform? Um, because I think there's the concern that if you don't have the capacity to investigate a case, then you end up just seeing this person over six months do shipment after shipment after shipment and the frustration of not being able to do anything about that. Um, but then also the frustration of, okay, if I report this person, am I gonna lose track of them? And that's something which I've struggled with massively in terms of thinking about what I what we do. But I think, uh, I think what Andrea said about creating these networks between organizations where you have these connections of trust, where you identify which organizations have the best resources, the best experience and the skills to take forward certain things, certain investigations. Um, and I think this is why these events are great because I've now become aware of individuals who I didn't know were working in this space, um, who maybe have the capacity that as an organization, we don't take things forward. And if I were to think of a solution, it is that realizing the various advantages and disadvantages of actions and organizations and working together to sort of make the best decision in, in each individual case. Uh, it's very waffly, but that's as far as I've thought of and come to on the issue, really. Thanks, that's, that's, that's great. great. Um, really insightful. Really insightful. You, you know, you've had that experience to come across that. And um, I think, Leonardo, if you want to see you've got your hand up there, I don't know if you, with what you've been doing, um, sort, sort of feed in as well. Yeah, just at this point, uh, to what uh, just been said, it is when we, we consider reporting, especially for all of the citizens, we also need to take account of the different legislation regarding data protection, data compliance, and for example, what information you can gather in the US is much more like you can gather much more information, collect, analyze much more information than in Europe or in the UK, where the GDPR would be much more would restrict what information can be collected and therefore what information can be uh, reported because we're not uh, law enforcement agencies and who may or may not, that is not my problem, but you know, uh, contravene the, the law, but we also have to comply with the law. We also need to, I mean, this is a limit that we should consider, uh, especially for um, in this, Hackathon as also a limit to take account. Thank, Thank you very much. much. That's, That's great. great.
Does, does, does anyone, anyone have any have have questions? questions? Very good, but if you, you wanted to. Uh, no, I mean, I'm just kind of, I'm kind of like eager to get going. I think like <laughs> SFE going on Slack and I just, I mean, I'm just so inspired by all of these. I mean, it's overwhelming, right? There's a lot of challenges out there, but I really think that there's, you know, incremental steps. You know, I'm, 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 I'm a realist, but I'm also an optimist. And so um, I just really appreciate the perspectives of the panelists because they offer like a reality check, but then also some um, encouragement. I mean, what's within the realm of, of, of the possible? And I think we really can make a difference here. Um, so I guess, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I just want to say thank you. Um, that, so that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. No, I, I, I think it's been, it's been wonderful. It's been so great to have, um, you know, so many different perspectives and so many different uh, viewpoints on this, especially with different expertise, you know, Andrea on the intelligence side and Chris and others on the tech side and then Elisa, uh, Lionel on the, on the actual work on the social media side of things and Patricia with an amazing experience on the chief side. So it's just been brilliant. And um, thank you all so much for your time. Uh, really appreciate everything. And, um, and Wendy as well was just marvelous. So yeah, so I think unless there are any other questions, team, uh, what we'll do now is we will uh, move over to Slack. Your mentors will be in touch with your groups to set up a quick call to see how you're getting on, provide a bit of guidance. And then the task is then to work together over the next uh, 12 hours, over the next 24 hours, 26 hours actually, to uh, attack the challenges as best you can um, and then to submit to us your final solutions by seven o'clock uh, GMT time tomorrow evening. And then after that, we will have a closing ceremony. We've got um, another great guest speaker there. And from then really, we'll, we'll have a bit of a judging panel for our, uh, two weeks, and we will announce the winning team from each of the different challenges. And we'll be in touch then with the expert prize mentors as well, one to one mentoring. So I think we're gonna finish now. I wanna say thank you very much to all of our amazing speakers. I uh, really appreciate everything. And hope you're all excited. And uh, okay, let's get going. See what we can get. See what we can put together. So uh, thank you all very much. It's been a pleasure. And um, yeah, we'll now be see you on Slack. See you there. Thanks, Harry. Right, Good luck, thank everyone. You. Bye bye. Thanks, Good everyone. Thank you. Bye. Happy Halloween, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Have fun. Can we just take a quick picture before everyone turns off their camera? Oh yeah. Sorry, right. Oh we yeah, we, we can. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Better here. <laughs> we, uh, quick, uh, okay, so we've got the camera on. Who's uh, who's there? Uh, yeah, those that want to. I'm just gonna. Um, we include our pets. Okay. Awesome. Can you take it, Harry, or do you want me to? Um, I don't. Yeah, I can. I can try. Should we put it on the gallery? Would that be the best one to go on? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Right. So I think everyone's here. We've got a dog as well with uh, Trisha. All right, okay, is everyone ready? After three, we'll give it a good, a good wave and a smile, I think. Uh, one, two, three. Amazing. Okay, brilliant. All right, everyone, I will see you on Slack. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye, cheers, enjoy. Bye-bye. Thank you.